Hey, what's going on, fight fans? This is Sean with Boxing Social and Other Sports. Here with my co-host, Olu, in the corner. And we have a special guest in here, Ellis Wims, Super Bowl champion with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, Super Bowl 37. Mm -hmm. uh, you were number 96. Yep. yep. Uh, man, thanks for being here today. Man, cool, man. You know, just good to be able to come out, chop it up a little bit, you know, have a little conversation about sports life or, you know, whatever y'all want to talk about. So, uh, I'm in the building, man. What's up? Let's do it. All right. So, listen. So, let me make sure. So, I want to make sure I'm pronouncing it right. So, you're from a place called um, Indianola, Mississippi? Indianola, Mississippi. Uh, in the heart of the Mississippi Delta. In the heart of slave country. Um, I was going to ask you what was it like yeah. growing up there. Because, listen, the, the, the 2010 census actually had only a population of 12,000 people. And most of them were black. Like, 70-something percent was yeah. black there. And they said like forty percent um, of the population is married. The other sixty percent single moms trying to make it on their own and all that. Um, yeah, I mean that's the, that's that's the story for a lot of you know small towns uh, in in the in the South. Uh, you know, you it, it's it's it comes out of you know slave culture and it's great yeah. people. Uh, you know, is is people who love family. They stick together. Uh, but it's one of the tougher environments in America uh, to to raise and build a family. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of poverty. There's not a lot of opportunity. Uh, so you know, you, you it's it's a it's a it's a great place, man. It's like you know, going down to the south is good food. It's good people. Mm -hmm. People are nice. You know, they have a good time. Uh, you know, a lot of my family still there. So when I go home, I have a great time. Okay. Uh, actually, um, you know. Uh, B.B. King is from my hometown. B.B. King is from B.B. King? Yeah, B.B. King is from Indianola, Mississippi, man. The home, oh. of the, the home of the blues, man. I, I, spent a lot of, <laughs> I spent a lot of time in hole-in-the-wall blues clubs what? in the I-Town, man, you know, in the Mississippi Delta. So yeah. it's cool, man. You know, it was it was a good upbringing, uh, but just like, you know, a lot of uh, small towns in the South, there are some 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 issues that you can struggle mm. with, but you know I'm, I'm blessed to yeah. to be to be from where I'm from. How far is that from Meridian, Mississippi? Uh, maybe a couple hours. Oh. You know, one of my one of my teammates from our Super Bowl team, uh, Kenyatta Walker, um, he's from Meridian, Mississippi. Man, we came out of high school the same year, college the same year. He was the first round pick uh, in Tampa the same year. I was the sixth round pick, so. Uh, yeah, Meridian, not too far, man. It's, you know, it's, you know, ain't nothing in Mississippi too far from each other. Yeah. You, know, you can always get somewhere. And, and what was it like like growing up there? Was you like mom, dad, brothers, sisters? How many of there were y'all? Well, uh, my mom was a single mom. Again, like you said, 60% uh, of the uh, of the population was single mom. So my mom was a single mom. Uh, I had an older sister, Carmen, a uh, younger brother, Brian, and a younger sister, Shakira. You know, I was the kind of the middle child. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so had my mom, uh, you know, me and my, my three siblings, man, and, and a lot of my family was there. My grandparents were a huge part of my life, mm -hmm. you know, and my mom had both her sisters there. Uh, one of mm -hmm. her brothers was there. Okay. And they had families there, so. Um, now, when you say they, you talking about all in the same house? No, all, all in, in the same, same city, all in the oh, same okay. area. Yeah, all in the same area. No, not in the same house. No, yeah, right. hey, there's families yeah, like that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but yeah, no, it ain't. You know, it, it ain't that tough. You know, you know, my mom actually worked in a lawnmower factory for 18 years there, so she raised us working in the factory. Uh, you know, my mom was a tough woman. Uh, you know, did the best she absolutely absolutely could for her children. Mm -hmm. uh, made sure we kind of stayed on the straight and narrow. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was blessed to have a good mom, man, a strong mom that kind of kept me straight. Okay. Yeah. So what was it like uh, as far as, like, sports? Did you play sports growing up or did you get into What did you like to play growing up? I like, you know, what we like, what we AAU or uh -huh. YMCA, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, growing up where I grew up, man, it was like you know front yard. You know, my front my front yard was like the the, the football the, field, the, the sports arena. <laughs> you know, I had the basketball court. We played baseball in my yard. You know, we played football in my yard. We wrestled. Uh, so yeah, everything, uh, especially with football, you know, was in the front yard, backyard. We used to have games where you know streets would play versus streets. So I lived on Easy Street, so it'd be Easy Street versus Carefree Drive or Easy Street versus Broadway. So we you know put together our teams from our streets, uh, get together, play a game, and you know the the winner of the game like uh, got a watermelon. So you know, yeah. we, you know we sat out there, but we all kind of sat down to share the watermelon <laughs> yeah. at the end. Anyway, we yeah. just got out there and competed for it. So right. it was cool, man. It was, you know, it was it was cool growing up. I had a lot of fun. 
All right, so this is uh, it's like in the seventies, right? Seventies going into eighties. Yeah, I was born Late in seventy nine. So 79. a lot, you know, when I was out, you know, with friends and stuff, probably was late eighties, nineties. You know, when I was really, you know, kind and of. That's, a kid. that's a big drug academic around that time. I mean, it, you know, growing up in an area like that, you said it's not really having a lot. You know, a lot of people turn to drugs or violence and this and that. Did you ever lose any friends or, or have any struggles or the people trying to? Get y'all to become dealers or anything? I, I don't think uh, in our area, in the small towns in the South, you always I mean drugs are everywhere. Yeah. So you're always going to have people who sell drugs or, you know, on the street mm-hmm. hustling. That's like everywhere in the country that's going to happen. Uh, we had some violence, not a lot. You know, it was a shock to the community yeah. when somebody got shot and killed. But it happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, crack was there. You know, cocaine was there. Uh, so, you know, a lot of those hard drugs were there. Uh, mm-hmm. But, you know, it was also a very faith-based community. Okay. Uh, so, you know, people tended to kind of frown upon being involved in those type yeah, of things. Yeah, yeah. So I think since it wasn't like the norm, uh, you know, again, it was very faith based. So, you know, everybody went to church on Sundays. My okay. entire family went to church on Sundays. So, if you were involved in drugs or something like that, you were kind of like an outlier. Yeah, like, yeah. like, it wasn't like, yeah, it yeah. wasn't, but it was there. You know, gang right. activity was there. Mm-hmm. You know, we had people who thought they were Crips and Bloods. I'm like, how you going to be a Crip and a Blood in the Mississippi Delta, bro? Like, get out of here with that. Like, right. But we had it. You know, yeah. we had vice lords and folks and, oh, you know, wow. all of that stuff kind of. Yeah, all of that stuff <laughs> migrated, man. Yeah, GDs, all gangster disciples, all that was yeah. there, man. So, you know, uh, but you had people, some, most of the people that from Chicago or, you know, some uh-huh. of L.A. They are from Mississippi. Yeah, they from yeah. the Sip, you know, they from yeah. the South. They That's got, t- you know, they got ties. Yeah. So a lot of them people, they're going to matriculate back, you know, their mama, yeah. they get, they start acting up in L.A., their yeah. mama send them down to the yeah. Delta. <laughs> yeah. You know, they got in trouble. Somebody want to kill them. So yeah. they sent them down to the Delta <laughs> to hide or whatever. So, yeah. you know, we, you had that. And, and then you had some of those things kind of matriculate in. But it, yeah. I don't think it was ever right. uh, to the level that you see in the cities. Was your yeah. town segregated? Uh, very segregated. Yeah, very segregated. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I went to a, a, a high school that was probably 99% black. Uh, oh. the, it was. I went to Gentry High School. So, you know, very segregated. You know, all, all black high school. Uh, all the white kids somehow could afford to go to the private school. Uh, like all, even though they worked in the same places that everybody else worked at. But um, I can honestly say, though it was segregated, like I never felt racism. Like I never felt people like angry towards me or mm-hmm. it was just people were separated. So economically things were separated, you know, because yeah. the landowners were typically white and the farmers mm-hmm. were typically white. Uh, and, you know, Mississippi Delta is, you know, one of the fer- most fertile farmlands on the planet. Uh, so there you're going to get a lot of soybeans and cotton, all these, these, you know, these products that we use and products throughout the planet. Mm-hmm. A lot of them growing right there in the Mississippi Delta. But, you know, the economy and, and the schools and a lot of those things were segregated. Uh, again, you're talking about the heart of slave country, you know, the Mississippi mm-hmm. Delta. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, very segregated. But I never uh, I didn't we didn't kind of mingle. You know, black and white, but it wasn't like this hostility. Right. It was just like your community's here, our community's here. Okay, you say you felt it. Okay, you say you didn't feel it when you was growing up, but as a grown man, looking back, can you say, uh, yeah, th- there were moments where, okay, this was racism or this was systematic? Because, you know, from Mississippi, I, I visited there a couple of times, yeah. right? Like, I think. People are so content um, mm-hmm. in Alabama and Mississippi mm-hmm. with things just being the way they are. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, can you, can you touch on that? Like, I mean, is it that's just the way life is and everybody's content with it? And, you know, the stat, that's the status quo. Well, I think when I was growing up, it was probably more. I think now people are starting to be a little bit sick of it. Uh, I think people are starting to see uh, in, in a lot of these small towns in the south across Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. Again, you're seeing more black people be elected uh, in towns that they're actually uh, the majority in. You know, so they're starting to kind of take control uh, of their own destiny with, you know, the local courts, you know, the, the, the local politicians. A lot of times are starting to represent uh, the, 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 the demographics of these cities. But. Um, I think you still are going to have, you know, a certain level of separation because people are just comfortable where they're comfortable. Mm-hmm. And I'm from the, you know, I'm from the, the, the school of if you're comfortable in that environment, cool. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Like, you don't have yeah. to come and intermingle with me. I just don't want uh, roadblocks being put up for certain people and, mm-hmm. and, and not being put up for others. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't like when resources are divvied up in cities or towns based mm-hmm. on what you look like or where you live. Like, you can choose to live wherever you want. But when we talk about the resources of the city, which everybody pays taxes, everybody pays property taxes, mm-hmm. you know, everybody's kids goes to the schools. And in order for these cities to do better and be better, mm-hmm. like those resources have got to be distributed throughout these cities and towns. Mm-hmm. When I was growing up, that was not the case. Right. right. You know, we didn't have books. A lot of times the private schools always had books. Oh, wow. We didn't have books. You know, private schools had computers. We don't have computers. Mm-hmm. You know, private school teachers get paid more. Our teachers get paid less. When those things are happening, then you have the inequality. But as far as where you choose to spend your time and who you choose to go to church with or restaurants you choose to go eat at, yeah. and if you want that to be a certain environment, I don't really care about that. Right. Like, because I, you know, I grew up in, in certain areas I want to go party. Yeah. In certain areas I want to go eat. It's certain type yeah. of people, like, you know, I, I grew up and, I, and I'm used to this environment. I'm used to this type of music. Yeah. You know, I'm used to this smell when I walk in the building uh-huh. and it's a party. Uh, so, right. you know, I, I, I get that, but I just don't like the, when everybody's a part of the city, everybody's a part of the school district, when resources are being divvied up in a way that aren't fair, uh, those things that kind of, I think happened when I was growing up that may be still happening now, mm-hmm. but I think there's more representation based on how the demographics are. All right. Yeah. So, you know, in high school, you said you went to Gentry High School, Gentry right? High School, yeah. Um, at what point in high school did you realize that, you know what, I might have a shot going to college playing football? Or what, when did you start playing football? What grade? And I started playing organized football when I was seventh grade. Um, and I actually, like, my first year playing, like, I broke my leg. So, uh, you know, I played a few games, broke my leg. I was out for the season, had a full leg cast. Uh, so um, my mom really probably didn't think I wanted to go back. But, you know, I went back the next year because we always played football growing yeah, up, yeah. you know. And, uh, you know, the, the 49ers were huge. So I was a big Jerry Rice fan. Like, Jerry Rice went to Mississippi Valley State, like, okay. you know, 20 minutes from where I grew up. Um, um, you know, Walter Payton went to Jackson State. You know, so, we, you know, we got a chance to go see Mississippi Valley versus Jackson State. Not see those guys play, yeah. but to see those guys that I knew came from those schools in the NFL, mm. uh, you know, that kind of drove kind of the excitement around playing football in the neighborhood. Okay. You know, Jerry Rice was ridiculous at yeah. that time. So I was a huge 49ers fan. So, um, so you know, uh, I, I came back, played eighth grade, yeah. uh, you know, started playing high school ball as a ninth grader. Uh, and I had a coach um, – uh, and again, uh, a white guy, uh, Coach Calhoun. Uh, again, uh, the, the the head coach, who was a black guy, Coach Harris, wasn't really for starting, you know, freshman players. Mm. Uh, but he had me, who was ninth grade, and a guy named Eddie Warren, who was tenth grade. And both of us were really tall. So, and we were the defensive ends. Uh, and the head coach, Coach Harris, did not want us to start. Right. And Coach Calhoun was like, "Look, either Ellis and Eddie are starting." Or you can find somebody else to coach. Right. Because I want these guys, like, to be here and be the starters. And, again, right. we, he was a white guy on the staff at an all-black high school. Mm. Uh, but Coach Calhoun was just a good man. You right. know what I said? Right. It wasn't about being black or white. He was about a good man. And he went to bat and he fought for me as a, to start as a freshman, which I started as a sophomore. I was MVP of the team as a sophomore. Uh, and what position was this? Uh, I was at, at defensive end and tight end. Okay. Defensive end and tight end. And then – um uh, end up moving a linebacker like my sophomore year, uh, play linebacker and tight end all through high school. I kicked, kicked off. So I rarely ever came off the field, right? Mm. I rarely ever came off the field. And my senior year, uh, we got a new head coach because the head coaching job was always in flux. Mm. Uh, a guy named Walter Jordan. Okay. Uh, and Coach Jordan, uh, you know, again, I – I grew up without my father, mm-hmm. but uh, my father was there. You know, he was in the town, my, my, um, and my father and Coach Jordan were kind of like buddies, you know, mm-hmm. like kind of drinking buddies. Okay. So he asked, when he first got the job, he asked me, uh, he was like, boy, what's your daddy's name is? And I was like, well, I think his name Jimmy, right? Because I had never really hung out. You know, I ain't wow. know him. Yeah. And, you know, we in a small town. Like, I ain't know yeah. him. I ain't never really talked to him. Yeah. You know, uh, but he was married at the time. Okay. So, you know, I get he had another family. He couldn't be, like, interacting mm-hmm. with me. I didn't get that then, but I kind of get that now. Oh, okay. Um, uh, so uh, he kind of took to me. Uh, he kind of saw I had some talent. 
uh, and he took off on his own. He took me to the Ole Miss football camp so those people could see me. Uh, uh-huh. He took me to Mississippi State's camp so those people could see me. He took me to a camp in Arkansas where people could see me. So he invested in me uh, because, you know, he knew my dad, mm-hmm. right? And I think he kind of probably made my dad kind of pay. Like, dude, I had to take your son. Mm-hmm. I had to spend 200 I'll take your son. You need to get, you know, you need to, you know, you need to take care of that, yeah, right? Yeah. So, but they were like buddies. So he kind of took me around and made sure I got the exposure. He mentored me. Mm-hmm. I had a ridiculous temper. Like, I had a ridiculous temper. Really? Ridiculous. And he all. I mean, just wanting to fight and. Just like, not, it, it, and I wasn't like a, like a thug fighting. Yeah. It was more like, like if I got frustrated about something, I was going, I was going to blow. Yeah. Like I, if it was like, you know, in a basketball game, football game, like in basketball and football, all the refs hated me. All the refs hated me. Cause again, I like fly off the handle. I'm cursing, I'm yelling, I'm yeah. screaming. Yeah. Like, all the time, so they all yeah. they used to be telling me all the time, "Hey, if you better chill out, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick you out of here." And I'm like, you know, I was I was off the chain, dude. Yeah. I, like I had a ridiculous, yeah. ridiculous temper. So he always talked to me about controlling my temper, right. keeping my poise. And uh, uh, Coach Jordan did a lot for me, man, as for just fighting for me. He made sure I was on the All State team because our team sucked. Mm-hmm. Like our team, we were like you know three four win team a year. Uh, so we weren't like a you know, all black school. Sucked, yeah, yeah, really? yeah. Was, was that meaning no athletes, or was you just like just a small, small school, or how big was the school? Uh, it was not, it was a five A school. It wasn't the athletes, and, and what I tell people about a lot of times with with all black schools or schools that traditionally lose, they don't have a winning culture. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. they don't understand how to win. Right. They don't understand how to create create that environment. And it ain't just about lifting weights and running. Right. It's it's definitely not about plays. Because right. we used to play against teams that come out and run four plays the whole game and beat us by fifty. Definitely. So they're not like X's and O's gurus. You yeah. know, they're just they were just discipline. They were just discipline. Uh, they believed okay. in themselves. And again, growing up in these environments, um, a lot of times. The coaches come from that, you know, the slavery, the, the 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 mentality that keeps a black man thinking a certain way. Where okay, if if it's white, it's better than us, mm. right? And even though you know, how sometimes people say things and they're saying it in a way where they think they're trying to like get you, you going. Black coaches, the or? coaches, they might be like, man, them people gonna beat y'all, but they gonna kick y'all ass. You know, y'all ain't gonna beat them boys. And then this is what the coaches. That's what the coaches would say. Okay. But thinking is like you know trying to rev us up, but it was more like that mentality of they don't believe we can beat these people. Mm. Like you know, and so they don't understand how to kind of create a winning environment. They don't understand how to really build a team a certain way. And that happens a lot of times with, with, with schools who just, not just black schools, but, a lot, you know, all schools where the coaches don't understand how to create a winning culture. But particularly, a lot of times with our schools, the coaches are really hard yeah. on the players. Yeah. Like, yeah. They, they're so quick to tell you what you're not. And they rarely mm-hmm. focus on what you are. That, that's the old school football culture. Yeah. yeah. And it, it just beats you down. And the best coaches I've had in the world, like, they're going to hold me accountable to what my job is, but at the same time, they know I got to go out and slay a dragon on Sunday. They know I got to go out and slay a dragon on Saturday. Mm-hmm. So if I'm not confident that I can slay this dragon, if I'm second-guessing myself and because of you telling me what I'm not all week, like mm-hmm. I'm just mentally, even though I'm a better athlete in every aspect than this person I'm lined up across, I'm not sure. Wow. So I attack it like that. Right. And that's like winning culture. Like you got to feel like uh, when I go out here, I'm better than this dude, even if you're not. Because even, even if he better than you, if he don't believe he better than you, you probably going to punch him in the face. Right. Like you probably going to dominate him because yeah. he just ain't sure. And you would you, you will see you will see little dudes all the time. You be like this little dude like he can play no ball, but he a wolf because he a wolf up here. Right. And this guy that's huge and muscles and tall and out there getting slammed on his neck. Cause he don't believe it. He don't believe he a monster. Like, and that's where, like, that's winning culture. Like, you got to make people believe in that. A lot of times, I know it didn't happen with us, uh, and a lot of times it doesn't happen in our schools. You, you know, Ellis, that's funny. That you said that uh, Olu was talking about when he played football, right? And I'm like, oh yeah, you only butt so big. But he said he had that mentality that I don't care how small you're going, you're going to get it. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, is that yeah. how your coach built? Did y'all coach build y'all well, up? I mean. Or? 
my 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 experience was different. I mean, because I mean, I come from the inner city, right? Yeah. So, uh, you play ball, you know, on concrete. You play ball in the grass. Yeah. And then you know, um, you know where I come from. You have to be able to do three things. You have to be able to talk, shit. Mm-hmm. You have to be able to throw them hands. Mm-hmm. Or you have to be able to run and go tell. Yeah. So. Uh, you didn't want to go run and go tell. Yeah. So every day, you know, you had to have that dog mentality. Yeah, yeah. On and off the field. Yeah. It's just that, you know, football is still that discipline yeah. in you. So that's why what I was telling Sean, it's like, you know, um, just being in the inner city environment, man, you know, and especially my parents were immigrants. So, yeah. Uh, I had... Uh, I was going to school with like uh, suited and booted, literally mm-hmm. church mm-hmm. clothes. Mm-hmm. So um, when I would go to school, you know, kids would talk noise because you know they was in a uh, starter jacket. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I didn't have a starter jacket. Yeah, but you know what, man? Uh, why you dress like that? Why you talk like that? Why you smell like that? You yeah. know. So I mean, I wasn't gonna get picked on. Yes. Yeah. Um, I had a cousin who was a little older than me, and I saw her get picked on. Yeah. And I knew right away that, you know, okay, I wasn't the best slick talker at that point. Yeah. But you know what, man? I wasn't going to go down without a fight, so I knew I had to fight. Yeah. And then when I got into football, it was controlled. Yeah. So Football yeah. is awesome, man, to, to be able to provide that environment. Again, provided you have the right leader. True. You got to have the right leader, the guy, yeah, and the guy that you can look up to and go to and the guy that sets the tone for the entire program. And, and again, you can see in the NFL, like, these these owners, they don't have a clue sometimes what leadership looks like in that environment. The Browns. Yeah, yeah, the Browns. Oh, man, terrible. <laughs> yeah. Have no idea. Have no idea what leader. <laughs> yeah, have no idea what it looks like. But, but you know, I, I always say when it comes to sports in general, uh, I was telling somebody this the other day. The franchises that are always picking in the first round, mm. the first five picks, year after year after year. Like when you when you talk about f- basketball, right? Sacramento is always picking. Cleveland is always picking. If it wasn't for LeBron being yeah. from Cleveland, Cleveland would have never won that championship. I mean, so it's year after year, because like you said, man, I mean, it's a mentality, it's a culture Mm -hmm. that you just got to build. Yeah, yeah. and you got to have a person to build it. And I think a lot of times the billionaire owners, again, they may understand their business. Uh, A lot of times, maybe some of them probably got their businesses handed down to them, uh, their wealth handed down or the team handed Mm -hmm. down. And the guy that actually, their father or whoever actually built the business uh, didn't really kind of train them on what it looks like when there's a person in front of you that can get a job done. And they can be fooled. They can be fooled by, you know, lofty talk. Mm. And But when you're in a, in a locker room with a group of, uh, a group of men, uh, football players, uh, playing in the NFL or playing in college, where there's a lot on the line and a lot at stake, man, you got to have a guy that's a leader. You got to have, have a guy that's a wolf that can connect with them guys in a way and get them inspired, um, especially the guys that are paid. Like, you can have a guy that's trying to get paid, and he's going to run through a wall for you because he's still trying to get paid. But for the most part, the NFL teams, like, the guys that make the big money and that are set financially, they're not really motivated by money anymore, right? Because they know their, their mortgage, their house is bought, cars, kids is straight. Like, so when I show up to this place, how are you going to keep me motivated to go out here? Because football is hard. Yeah. And you can just say, oh, yeah, because you're getting paid. But it ain't about getting paid. It's about competition. And, like, are you going to really get how – you, how do you get these guys to pick their level up and want to go out and compete for you um, when all their bills is paid okay. and you can't motivate them by money anymore? Mm-hmm. And that's when you got to have, like, a Mike Tomlin. Like that, like can inspire guys to show up and like just compete and like just you know we going out here to win today because we just we just a bunch of dogs that love to compete and we coming out to win and but a lot of times owners Brian Flores yeah 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 and and, and <laughs> owners don't know what that looks like right yeah, yeah. Brian Flores in Miami yeah, yeah, yeah. he's doing he's doing, he's doing mm-hmm. you know he yeah. can connect with them dudes and he can right. get them to compete even though everybody said they was tanking right right Ellis what what made you before you even went to the NFL and you said that coach took you around, 
What made you choose Mississippi State? Were there other colleges you could have went to? Oh, yeah, yeah. I had um, uh, University of Kentucky offered me, Arkansas offered me, Ole Miss offered me, University of Hawaii, which there was no way in hell I was going to Hawaii. Like, that wasn't happening. So, uh, <laughs> But, um, uh, you know, Mississippi State came. But Mississippi State, honestly, I felt comfortable on campus. Uh, and it was close enough for my mom to be able to come and see me play. My mom is a huge sports fan mm. and, and definitely a huge sports fan with all of her children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews. Mm. Like my mom will sit there and watch like, you know, college volleyball, you know, like wow. she just she's just a huge sports fan. So uh, for her to be able to get to me and get to our games uh, was huge. So I, right. that that's one of the, you know, the, the culture at Mississippi State. And then Coach Cheryl. Coach Cheryl was the type of coach that's, that's, that's really like a father figure. Like Coach Cheryl. Yeah, Jackie Cheryl. Okay. Yeah, I mean, he was like the type of head coach that really cared about his players, mm -hmm. uh, really understood where we came from. Right. Like, you know, a lot of times, and especially in this day and age, you know, a kid make a mistake, you ready to kick him off the team and yeah. this, that, and the other. And Coach Cheryl understood, man, these 17, 18, 19-year-old kids, a lot of them come from environments that are tough. Mm -hmm. So if they do something stupid, like, we'll punish them, but we're not ready to get rid of them. You know, he'll he'll give us grace and allow us to grow into men. Because right. uh, you come there as 18, 19-year-old, you leave 21, 22 years old. That's a lot of growth and maturity right. over that time. And a lot of those guys that play for Coach Cheryl now, again, are husbands and fathers, who, who didn't have the husband and father around in their life because Coach Cheryl kind of set that tone for us. And he just gave us grace, man. Like, you know, we're kids. Yeah. Like, on a f football camp, you know, college football, like, <laughs> it's a crazy environment, yeah. bro. And then you're like the you're the star of the attraction on campus. All right. It's, it's a crazy environment. Like, you're going to do crazy stuff, so and he let us make let's, it. Let's talk about this college because that's the highest that I've played at, right? Yeah. Okay, so what was your what was your college experience like? Um, it was great, man. You know, I, like I said, our high school team was terrible. Right. So I didn't come from winning. So my four years at Mississippi State, you I played in the SEC. I played in the SEC. Okay, yeah, yeah, I played in the SEC. So we was in the conference with Alabama, Auburn, Arkansas, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida. We was in the SEC West, man. though. So it was it was us, Ole Miss, Arkansas, Alabama. And, and Auburn. Those wow. were, I think, the five teams at that time in the SEC West. And, and LSU. And, what, and, and what, LSU, LSU, yeah. yeah. What, what years was this? This was 97 to 01. 97 so, 01. Uh, so, so at, this is the year that, this is like, okay, SEC was good, but um, the Miami was still ruling at that time. Yeah, I think Miami was still one of the, probably the top team. Um, I think Alabama was, was was there because Alabama had Sean Alexander, Sean Alexander uh, yeah. and uh, remember they had big offensive tackle uh, that played for Washington. Man, I can't think of his name right now. Oh, Chris Samuels. Yeah. Uh, so at uh, you know Auburn, uh, you know Tequil Spikes and them guys. Yeah. Uh, Tennessee won a national championship. Yeah. They they it was T Martin and them guys, and they beat they beat us. Actually, we won the SEC West. Uh, that was my sophomore year, and they beat us in the SEC championship game. Uh, they had to go, Jamal, Jamal Lewis. Jamal uh, Lewis I don't know. Back. I don't know what's Jamal. Jamal may have been. I think he may have been the running back then. Yeah. I just remember T. Martin and uh, Peerless Price and them dudes. Yeah. yeah. And and they barely beat us in the SEC championship game, uh, but they ended up winning the national championship. So yeah, SEC football week in and week out, dude. First of all, it's eighty thousand people in every single stadium. All right. So every time you go on the road, it's a madhouse. Like wow. it's crazy. Like people come out. Like you watch. Like you know, you watch Big Ten football. You watch that stuff on, and and it's cool. It's a crazy environment. SEC is like a blood sport for the fans. Uh, like you go to LSU for a night game. Like they gonna yeah, snap. They crazy. yeah, def, it's crazy. They drunk. They snatching flags off people's cars, throwing stuff, throwing <laughs> beer at the bus. Like, you know, it, they got a tiger at the gate when you come out on the field. Wow. Tiger growling at you. It, the fans are crazy. So it's like Jeez. it's an unbelievable <laughs> environment it's to play in. Yeah, it's but it's fun, game. though. It's fun to be able to go into Auburn or go in, go, go down to Tuscaloosa and compete against them guys, man. It was uh, – and, again, I don't think we ever won less than eight games. Like, I had a lot of success. And that's really why I kind of learned how to win at, at Mississippi State. Okay. So, no. so okay. Um, did you ever feel like college was a business back then? Um, you know, coming from where I came from, student athlete. Um, coming from where I came from, 
um, during that time, I didn't really know what it was. You know, I was just kind of like participating. Now, we had a corner on our team. Uh, his name was Fred Smoot. Uh, and f he talked a lot of trash, which made him very marketable. Like, everybody knew him. He had a lot of antics and stuff on the field. Um, and so a lot of, you know, when you see, like, they're covering our games and they're talking about him. So, yeah, it wasn't a business for me back then. I didn't understand it. But for what he did at that time, he was very marketable and probably should have been getting paid for what he was doing, you know, but <laughs> it is what it is. Did you did you want to go to the league the next level and while you was in school or did were you just straight, I love the game, I just want to play? Man, I've you know what I tell people, man, I just was to like I just wanted to like play. Like I just wanted to like belong. Like again, coming from the environment that I came from, it's like you're always kind of trying to figure out do you belong? Uh, because you, one, you've never seen anybody else do it. I was the first person from a high school to ever get like a big time division one scholarship like that. Oh, wow. So it's like, I always kind of in the back of my head kind of questioned myself. Uh, and my freshman year, like I had never played defensive line. And like I went, when they signed me, I was like 235 pounds. When I showed up, I was like 260. Yeah. Like, you know, so they, they let me play linebacker during freshman camp for three days. And then when we started regular camp, it was like, man, look, you too big. You gotta go D line, you know. And I was, I was mad, you know. I was like, dude, D line, like you know, like because we played this defense where the linebackers blitzed and moved around. So I saw myself doing that. Uh, so I didn't want to do it, but I did it, you know, because I'm like, I'm just happy to be here, really. So whatever y'all want me to do, I do it. Uh, and I did pretty good at it. Uh, and Co I remember Coach Cheryl coming to me after the first few days of camp. He was like, man, if you do everything you're supposed to do, like you can play in the NFL. Uh, which I had never even, like, that wasn't even on my mind. Like, I was just happy to be there. Like, for me, oh, playing wow. in Mississippi State was the pinnacle. Like, Man. It, like playing in the NFL. And even with that, like, you know, uh, I played behind a guy for my first three years. I didn't redshirt. You know, I played my freshman year. I played behind, behind a guy for three years. So, going into my senior year, like, I'm thinking NFL, but not really because I'm like, I ain't been a starter. Like, so, but, like, I – Somebody sent me, like, a defensive end ranking going into my senior year, and I was on it for, like, NFL, you know, scouts. the scouts defensive end. Yeah. I was like, really? Like, I was shocked because I'm like, dude, I'm, you know, I'm a backup. Like, you know, I come in and I play, yeah. but I don't play, like, as much as he play. Yeah, right. Um, and, and in hindsight, like, I was always a better player, but, you know, he was a senior, and, you know, again, they marketed that guy, and that's where you talk about the business side of it that I didn't understand. Like, he was on the posters. They pushed him as an all-SEC candidate. I've never all-SEC candidate, ever. Oh, wow. So I wasn't, you know, the guy that they marketed. Uh, but, again, at Mississippi State, uh, and then this was a white guy uh, that was in front of me. So I get, you know, when you're building and branding this football mm -hmm. team in the state of Mississippi mm -hmm. and you need these people to support this team. The, the you boosters. Want, yeah, the boosters, absolutely, because <laughs> boosters make teams. Yeah. If you don't have money, right, you can't build facilities, you can't get players, you can't, mm -hmm. you can't do the things you need to do to run. So you got to okay. build a program that looks like what it needs to look like to market it to your, con your constituents. Right. Yeah, because, again, it ain't. A lot of black people buying tickets to come to Mississippi State games. Right. You know, it's it's white Miss the white people in Mississippi that are gonna come support that. But that makes sense. Like from a business standpoint, that makes sense. So I get it and I get it why it happened that way mm -hmm. for them. Now it may have hosed me a little bit, uh, but you know, I don't I look at things like I landed where I was supposed to land. Right. And I got the opportunities I was supposed to have. You never thought about going to an HBCU? Um no, no, because the HBCU didn't provide the training, the support, and the platform. Like, I went on a, I tell you, I went on a visit to Alcorn. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I had pretty much decided, I thought I decided, like, you know, I had all these SEC schools uh, coming after me. So, um, but Co again, Coach Jordan was like, look, you need to go on this visit. Some other players are going to go with you. So, you may not sign there, but. We want to create some opportunities for these other guys to go down there and meet the coaches and maybe get a chance to sign. So I went. Um, and honestly, like I had like when you go like you go to Arkansas, you go to Mississippi State, like these players are talking to you about coming to win. Like, yeah, dude, mm -hmm. we you know we need you. We need more. We're trying to win the SEC. We're trying to do that, blah, blah, blah. You go to Alcorn, 
I had players tell me, dog, you don't want to come here. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, dog, I'm just telling you, if you come here, dog, all you're going to do is drink and smoke cigarettes. All corn, okay. Yeah, all corn. So that's what the players telling me, yeah. right? So on one hand, it's like these dudes talk about win championships. Yeah. This dude telling me like, do you come here? You waste your life away. <laughs> like, like, dude, I came here and and if I, by, so. But like you said, like, uh, um, to to went to what did to go? Uh, I want to say he went to Magnese State, maybe something like that. Magnese, okay, no, but Jerry Rice. With the with Mississippi to, Valley State. Right, right, Mississippi Valley. Yeah. Like, I mean, you didn't go to Mississippi Valley. You didn't go to what other schools is there? Jackson State, yeah. Alcorn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And again, like, at that time, and, and what the HBCUs got to, I think, have to understand is, uh-huh. um, like, you have alumni. Right. And at this point, you've been around long enough where you should have successful alumni. Right. That can come out and build facilities. They can come out mm. and help build stadiums. They right. can come out and build programs. So when I come to your, when as a as a 17, I'm 17, 18 years old, mm. right? So you're going to go with the, where the magic is. Yeah. Like, I'm going to go where it's the, it, like, it's the cool jersey, right. right? You walk in the locker room and it's like glass on the locker rooms and it's TVs and you go to. <laughs> so Whatever school is sponsored by Nike. Yeah. <laughs> Rydell. Yeah. Right? You're a kid. So. It, it, the HBCUs <laughs> got to understand, to these kids, you're selling a product. Yeah. So if it's important to you, then whoever you've turned out that's made money, however, like, you got to raise money <laughs> and you got to build something that's going to intrigue a 17-year-old because he don't care about HBCU tradition. He a child, right? So me as a child, again, 18-year-old, I'm not a grown man. Like, as a grown man, you may make a different decision based on trying to help this university. As a child, you like, bruh, you see them cleats? You see them cleats homeboy had on, on CBS last week? Man, them cleats is fly. Them, them cleats is fine. I did that, too. I wouldn't go to any school that had Adidas. Yeah, man, because they look like, you know, some referee shoes. Like, you don't want to go play in no referee shoes. Like, man, I'm telling you, Adidas, Adidas and Reeboks. I mean, Smith had some it, cold Reeboks, but, it's fine. but yeah. you know, I was like, man, bro, I'm not. Uh, and, and Under Armour was starting. I saw the potential. Yeah. But I was like, man, I'm going to go to this school that had Nike. No, no, no. I ended up going to uh, SIU. Yeah. And they, they were sponsored by Under Armour. But when I was in high school, they had Nike. Yeah. But I would not touch a school with Adidas, man. No. Nah. <laughs> no, nah, you ain't putting them shoes on. Bro, my homeboy, we was in the league. You know, in, in the league, if you in the league, you know, <laughs> You got Nike coming after you, you know, yeah. not coming, but it's like you get to choose like who you want to give uh, to 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 provide you your shoes to play in. Right. So you know, Nike they are gonna give you like maybe a ten thousand dollar allotment on on uh, on apparel, and they gonna provide all your shoes to play in. Reebok gonna give you twenty thousand, and they gonna provide your shoes to play in. So my homeboy took the twenty thousand, right, for the Reebok. One, they look like referee shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and dude, I'm like, dude, I gotta, I gotta be swagged up when I go out there. Like, like I can't go out there on the field that's feeling like the, I'm in some bobos. Yeah. yeah. So I can't do that. So just yeah. to get the ten thousand, that's gonna hinder me from going out here and making a million. Cause I ain't feeling my, I ain't feeling what's on my feet. And then the kids don't want to be like, you. yeah, want to be like prime. Yeah, it won't be prime. You know what I'm saying? And then they, we in training camp. He having to put like salt meat on his feet because he got like <laughs> blisters from the Reeboks. So I'm like, bro, you should have went with them Nikes. We in training camp trying to eat right now. You know what I'm saying? We ain't all day. You know, you working. They got two two hour practices. Yeah. Your dogs got blisters on them. Yeah. But you trying to get this job right now? I'm like, yeah. bro, give me them Nikes, bro. Because my one thing can't be hurting on me right now is my feet. Yeah. They can keep them ten grand in apparel. Yeah. All that stuff. All that stuff corny anyway. Yeah. Reebok track suits and stuff. I don't want none of that, bro. Give me. I take that ten grand in Nike. I make but that. But you work. know what, man? I got a. I got a homeboy. <laughs> Um, I ain't gonna say what company he works for, right? <laughs> because you were you you were talking about uh, how HBCUs need to market themselves to mm-hmm. these younger players, right? What a lot of people don't know is these big these big uh, shoe companies. Let's just use Adidas, right? Because mm-hmm. Adidas did have a basketball scandal, right? Mm-hmm. So if Adidas doesn't want to fool with you as a school, mm-hmm. you know. Um, 
then your school's gonna suffer. So if the only if the only company that's willing to endorse your school is Rydell, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You have to take that money mm -hmm. some way, somehow though. So I mean the the thing is how do we get like these big time companies uh to to support these HBCUs? I think one, again, it, it, it comes down to business, you gotta build a brand. And you got to build a product that people want to come and see. But, 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 but okay, but before before integration, right? Yeah. People like you, mm -hmm. uh, all the best football players, they were going to HBCUs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then so, H, like the Nikes, the, the, the Reeboks, they seeing that you're going to these Alabamas. They seeing that you're going to these Notre Dames, USC's and stuff like that, right? So it's not necessarily the alumni mm -hmm. that is giving back because all the alumni combined ain't got more money than Nike. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, but if the, if the alum, say if you're building a brand, right? Right. And you know these Rydells, they ain't going to cut it. Yeah. Man, you know what? Hey, Adidas, hey, Nike, hey, we got 250K right. to buy product for our players. And we're, we're trying to build our brand, but we're willing to invest in it up front to make sure we're building the right brand. And we got alumni that, you know, we got five rich alumni and they all put up 50 grand to make sure we got the apparel, you know, and we're going to spend 250. Can y'all give us an extra 200 in apparel? Like, you know, since we're spending 250 with you and this is our fan base and, and, you know, this is how many people we got coming to our stadium. And, you know, like, so it's got to start from somewhere. Uh, but it, for me, it's like this. In business, again, these companies, if they see money in it, they will invest in it. If they don't see money in it, these companies, they they, they on the NASDAQ, right? These public traded companies, they're beholden to the to the to the shareholders, they're not going to pass up opportunities to build revenue for their company. Right. But you have to build something that these people, these companies want. And I think it's happening. I think, you know, Jackson State, I think they're doing a great job building their brand. They hired my D-line coach from college. Uh, and um, and, uh, and they're growing the program. I see some of the stuff that they're doing in branding to make it attractive mm -hmm. for kids to want to go there. And then you got to create an environment on campus that the kids want to come to. Again, you're dealing with kids. So they're not going to make a decision. And then a lot of times, honestly, you know, you talk about, you know, these SEC schools. Again, a lot of these guys being paid, right? Mm -hmm. So I was going to get to that. I was going to get to that. A lot of these guys being paid. Like, yeah. and if I come from nothing, yeah. and you tell me, hey, man, you know, we'll make sure your mom get $2,500 a month. Mm. Like, so, so it's a no-brainer. Did that, did that happen with you? Uh, oh no, what, what, not not really, not really. That's not that's not. Uh, alumni take care of you. I tell I'll tell you this. I was okay in college. Okay. I'll say that. Okay. I was okay. All right. I didn't I didn't have to worry about anything while I was at Mississippi State University. Okay. And I'll just leave it at that. Okay. I had to worry about nothing. I, I was I was a young man who was who was okay. All right. Yeah, and my mom was okay. Okay. So yeah. so. Was it you or what about like? Cause I always tell people like, okay, not every not everybody, cause we we stay in a capitalistic society. Mm -hmm. right? So and that's why I think it's a no brainer that college athletes should be paid. Absolutely, right? But, yeah. I mean, just like not every person at your job is getting paid the same. Not every teacher is getting paid the same. Not every student athlete should be paid the same either. Yeah. Because what a lot of people don't understand is they use football, especially if you're at a football school, mm -hmm. to supplement the other sports. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, listen, hey, water polo, if you're not making it, we got to yeah. cut your program yeah. off. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And that money that's going to the water polo, well, you got to pay the kicker. Yeah. I know the kicker is not the most popular player on the team, but he's still contributing to making money and generating for that team. Yeah. So my, my question to you is uh, the the bench, the person, like when you came in as a freshman, were you being taken care of as a freshman as opposed to, like is there, you know, did they give you more money that the alumni or the gods, where I'm from, we call them the gods. Like mm. the coaches would be like, hey, go see the gods. Yeah. So they could go bless you. Yeah. Uh, I would say uh, I was always okay from day one. Oh, yeah. Always. I was always okay. I never, there's no point in college where I didn't have money to do what I needed to do. Okay. 
at no point. Um, and again, but when you talk about revenue um, in the other school, the other sports, again, there are certain sports that generate an income. College football generates an income. And I was watching um, the, the documentary about the U. Yeah. Uh, ESPN and they talked about you know how enrollment went up like you know, a ridiculous amount mm. when Miami started to win football games and they were on national TV every yeah. week so obviously that increase in enrollment is driving revenue for the college right. now I don't think the water polo team drives revenue I don't think nobody <laughs> shows up on the campus because the water polo team won the national championship right. or the golf team all right. Yeah. They don't care. Like you have football, you have basketball, you have baseball who and the, are their revenue drivers. Okay. Uh, so it should be based on like how much how much money your sport generates. Sure. How much money does the, the, the football team generate? And again, that can be tracked. Mm. Right. We know how many people come through the door. Yeah. You know how many con TV contracts you sign. You know how much the contracts are when you get when you sign a contract to play a home and home <coughs> or however the revenue is coming in for that school right. that can be tracked. So I could see a, a, a way where, you know, if you're a starter, or you play a certain amount of plays. Hey, this amount of money will be you. You'll get this stipend. Sti all the kids can get a certain amount for a stipend. You know, I don't think uh, like day to day, like. You should have college athletes where, yeah, this guy got a $3,500 check. Well, you only got 500 But I can see where when you graduate, mm -hmm. every year that you play, just like in the NFL, like for every year that you play, you get a certain amount put into a 401K program. Mm -hmm. We're going to put a, a 25K up for you every year that you play here. And at the end of that, you once you graduate and get your degree, mm -hmm. we get a hundred grand to start your life. Right. Because of what you've given to this mm, university, okay. like I could see something like, like that, that making sense. So you do believe that athletes should be paid? Absolutely, absolutely. They should definitely be paid. Man, I saw something the other day where Oklahoma uh, in their 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 new signing class. You know, they just had signing day. Oklahoma was creating a logo for every player that they signed. So they're already thinking of ways to monetize these kids. Oh wow! And they ain't even stepped on campus. Jeez. So I didn't even know that. They you they look it up. There was they they had they had the the kids uh, initials, and were making a logo wow. for each kid that they were gonna put on products to sell. So Jeez. again. <laughs> And they and all they did was sign a letter of intent. That's it. Don't, don't, don't get me started. So, <laughs> so, so again, it's like they're monetizing that. Yeah. Right. So this kid should be. I mean, and you're gonna be taken care of as a college football player, right? You're yeah, gonna. Yeah. I mean, you gonna have money in your pocket. Mm -hmm. You're never gonna well, miss a meal. What you getting is just a drop in the bucket to what they're getting. Yeah. To what they're getting. Yeah. Because I did a I did a paper I did a research paper when I was in college. On, on on this this is way before right so the year that uh USC and Texas was in the national championship right Reggie Bush Vince Vince Young mm. Matt Liner mm. superstars right mm -hmm. in the college world so Reggie Bush's jersey Vince Young's jersey Vince Young's jersey and this is Texas right mm -hmm. Vince Vince Young's jersey I think sold especially right after he they won the championship I think they sold like ten, fifteen million dollars. Wow! Like worth of that number ten. That's crazy. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So now, what did he get of that? Nothing. Nothing. Zero. Tag on. That makes absolutely no and sense. Like you said, Man. enrollment went up. Like in Vince Young in Austin, still after retirement from the league, whatever. Mm -hmm. He. I, I'm like, man. That Like, man, when a player like Reggie Bush takes and, you know, people sit down there and get mad, oh, how could you do that to your university? And I tell Sean this, I'm like, man, look, look, I wish more players would sit down there and come out and, you know, just say F the system. Yeah, because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for you to tell me that you can make money off me, but I can't make any money. I not, not only can I make any money, nobody can do anything for me. Like it's re I, nobody could buy me a meal, like but wow. you made ten, fifteen million dollars yeah. off me, and I could see again, 
if you're the marquee player, you know, if you're Jalen Hurts in Oklahoma mm -hmm. and I'm wearing number seven, mm -hmm. you know, for that year, that should be a, a marketing deal between the school and Jalen. As many number sevens as you sell, then I should get a piece of that. Because those seven jerseys are selling because of me. If you put number seven on the kicker, it wouldn't sell. Like, nobody would buy it. But if you put it on Jalen, and he's out there throwing five touchdowns a game, and on ESPN every week, they're flying off the shelves. Right. So, like, there should be able to have a marketing agreement there. But, again, the powers that be, they want to keep that control. And it's all about, like, you know, it, it, to a certain extent, America all, has always been about free labor, uh, and right. you know, and that's if you're able to cut out the labor costs, mm -hmm. you can maximize your profits, and but, that's what that but, is about. But you see, that's why. Um, that's, and, and I was telling uh, Sean because me and Sean we had this debate all the time. So Zion Williams, you know, he had a little shoe incident where he mm -hmm. was getting paid, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm for it." But where he got in trouble, I think, is that they didn't report that on the taxes. Yeah. And I was like, okay, take the money, you know, it may not be moral, you know, for the university. And if the university gets in trouble, banners need to be taken down. That's on the university. Mm -hmm. They will be fine long after you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, get that money because you don't know how your career is going to be in the yeah. NBA. Yeah. Because you... Zion still hasn't played a game this year. Yep. Right. And, and don't know what his knee's going to do. You had the Greg Oden situation where Greg Oden never really – you know, play never really made the revenue that he pr predicted he was going to make. You see, see what happened with Demarcus Cousins. Exactly. Like Demarcus Cousins was expecting to be signing for one hundred and fifty, hundred eighty million dollars. Exactly. Health is destroyed now, and uh -huh. he'd be lucky, you know, to get veteran minimum with with his injury history. So Isaiah Thomas was right there. Yeah, Isaiah yeah, Thomas was right there. Surgery. Yep. So you know, it's 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 it, you have to strike while the iron is hot. And again, in business, people understand that mm -hmm. with athletes, particularly with black athletes, uh, people think like, you know, they should give up their name and their likeness for free. For free. And then based on a system that they didn't create. Um, and, and, and now we'll say this, like particularly with Zion, when people were talking about well, Zion shouldn't play anymore for Duke, like him playing at Duke made him some money because mm -hmm. he got a chance to really build a national brand for himself at Duke. Like, if he would have went, say if he would have went to China, like some of these guys are doing, mm -hmm. and played over in China, mm -hmm. he wouldn't have his Jordan contract. He, I think he would have got it regardless. I don't think he would have got it. Because, again, I think playing for Duke, playing in the NCAA tournament, being on TV in America year in and year out, like, he may have gotten a deal from, like, Lee Ning, you know, like, D-Way's company or something. You know, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. Anta, like, like Clay Thompson with Anta. Yeah. Uh, and that's another thing. You know, guys have a lot of opportunities other than Nike or Jordan to go with. But because he built his brand, because all he had was, like, a all he had was a social media brand. Let me, let me, let me tell you why I disagree with that. It's because Zion, I, I graduated a year after LeBron, yeah. right? So I was knowing LeBron before like he was in high school, mm -hmm. right? And Zion is different because you were knowing Zion in junior high and AAU. Yeah. Zion was growing up in the social media. So yeah. before he even signed with Duke, people were watching his highlights, mm -hmm. right? And so that's why I think he could have went anywhere and been okay. It's just like uh, LaMelo, right? Yeah. It's like LaMelo. People are really watching his games when he's in Australia or wherever he's playing, right? Yeah. And he's projected to be top three yeah. in picking the NBA. And so now what he actually does in the NBA, that's up to him. Yeah, but when he gets to the NBA, again, for the mainstream fan, for the for the kids that are in, you know, the Woodlands and the people who are buying, you know, the season tickets right. for yeah. Houston, he still got to build a brand for those people, right? Because they wow. they don't know him. Like, he's not, you know, in their face cheesing on, you know, on ESPN all day. Or, right. you know, it's like it, it, he's he's somewhere else. So, like, I know LaMelo because I'm on Bleacher Report. And I'll yeah. see a, a video run about his game. Oh, LaMelo, you know, had yeah. 30 and 10, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But it's like for the in the mainstream media, he's not. So, when he gets there... He's going to have to build that brand up to where he's like a Nike athlete, you know. Like, like you know, typically these guys don't come out of college and they're Nike athletes. Like, yeah, some guys that are really, really good players in the NBA. They're not no, Nike. So you don't think he's going to get a shoe deal, Lamelo? Yeah. 
it's he'll he probably will get a deal because they're going to uh, like we got deals like you right. know what I'm saying like it, it, but, yeah you go you go get like you know you'll get they uh, it, 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 they'll they, they would love to have any player in the NBA wearing Nike right but how much are they going to pay you right. to wear those Nikes cuz not that many people not that many people remember Dwayne Wade coming out of College, yeah, the converse, yeah, yeah, com, yeah, you're crying. But now, I'm to tell you right now, for me, I wear Lee Nings, yeah. I wear D Wade joints, yeah. and they fresh, yeah. And that's the they the best pair of basketball shoes I've ever worn as far as being comfortable on my feet. Yeah. If I go p- buy a pair of Kevin Durant's, my feet are gonna hurt, right? Because they made for Kevin Durant and his skinny feet, yeah. right? Like, or or I can't wear Kyrie's. Because, again, they squeeze my feet. No wonder why my feet hurt that time we played basketball. I had some KDs on. Bruh, <laughs> hey, get you some, go, go to Amazon and look at them Lee Names. Okay. Like, Lee Names. <laughs> names. They fresh. Yeah, I'm going to look it up. My son, my son play AAU basketball. Yeah. He played in Lee Names. Yeah. yeah. Right? He played, in Lee, he played in Lee Names last year. Yeah. And he loved them. Like, and oh, they yeah, fresh. RJ? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm saying that did look nice. Yeah, he had like some blue and yellow nice. knees. They for Goche. And then I think yeah. he got, they got him. Uh, they got uh, CJ McCollum. Um, somebody else, none of the young CJ kids. CJ McCollum signed with Lenny? Yeah. Really? Yeah, been for two years. And see, you see yeah. CJ out there again, cast work. Yeah. And I got this. I got the CJ McCollum that he be wearing, and I see why. I gotta yeah. ask my friend about that though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he he works for a big shoe company. Tell them to check it. Yeah, but again, it's like now there's with the internet and opening up that market in China, guys don't feel like they have to make it here. Like their their stuff don't have to be hot in the states. Right. It's a billion people in China. Oh, yeah. yeah. So about, and. I, I'd rather get a two hundred million dollar deal, yeah, than a twenty dollar, twenty million that Zion just got. Yeah, from Jordan, because yeah. again, yeah. it's like in, in in Asia, when them dudes go over there, they gods, yeah. right? And they probably getting ownership in the company. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. when uh, when Nike ain't offering that, like right. D Wade got a lifetime deal. Like probably nobody was offering him a lifetime deal at Nike. Like they got LeBron a lifetime deal. They got MJ a lifetime deal. Mm-hmm. Not D Wade, but it was with Lee Ning. He got a lifetime deal. Clay Thompson with a company called Anta, and Anta, I mean, make fresh shoes for him. I don't like them. I would. I don't like the one with the newspaper. You didn't like that. Yeah, I. I mean, it been a bit much for me. It been much. <laughs> a bit much. It, it, it was his personality. Yeah, though, right? yeah, yeah. But they, but they fresh though, That's and they cool. and they do a bunch of little fresh designs for him. And, and yeah. again, they being made in the same factories. That the Nikes being right, made right, in. Yeah. These dudes are just taking their own brand yeah. and building a, a shoe company or a shoe empire off their brand as opposed to Nike, like them adding their brand to Nike. It's like Clay Thompson is the marquee guy at Anta, and Anta is huge in Asia. Lee Ning is huge in Asia. Oh, okay. So they, yeah. and they make quality gear. Yeah. Like so, yeah. I, I mean, I, I wear Lee Ning. I got the I got the Lebrons on today. I probably got like I probably got like three or four pair of Lee Nings, mm-hmm. and my son got like three or four pair. All right, yeah. Ellis. Let's transition to this. So in two thousand one, we had the NFL draft. Mm-hmm. All right, what was that like? And were you just waiting there, or is there any like pre notion that you're going to make it? And eventually, we know you were drafted by Tampa Bay. But what's it like? The anticipation. You know, going into the draft. You said you was in the sixth round, so was, you wasn't there then. Yeah, no, I wasn't there. Yeah, I was I was at home at my grandmother's house uh, down in, you know, in Indianola. Uh, and it's tough, man, because, uh, you know, like, I went from pre-draft process to, like, not really even thinking I was, like, even in the picture to going to the Senior Bowl, going to the Combine, kind of seeing other players. And, like, and, you know, you know how it is sometimes, like, you'll, you'll see – a Nebraska uniform, and you'll think, okay, because that dude's at Nebraska, he must be great. Or this dude went to Miami, man, he must be great. Like, he must be better than me. And then you go through that pre jet process, and it's like, man, dude, like, I'm faster than this dude. I'm quicker. Like, we doing bag drills. This dude's falling down. <laughs> like, you know, like, I don't fall down over no bags. Yeah. Like, you know, like, really? Yeah. So after you go through that process, you go from, like, man, I don't know to, like, if these the dudes that they picking us against, like, I should be at least third, fourth round looking at they saying this dude got a third round grade and he can't do bag drills without falling on the ground? <laughs> yeah. Like, really? 
So, um, so I, you know, I, I went to thinking, you know, maybe I get drafted early because I went through the process, had a good pro day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you get there in the first day, okay, you don't go, you know, you're not, you're like, okay, cool. Uh, you wish you did, you know, maybe third round, I was thinking maybe somebody might pull the trigger, but no. Then you get to the next day and it's like fourth round go. It's like, man, okay, fifth round go. Like, dude, like, so, yeah. and, and then like, you got to the sixth round. Uh, so I'm already kind of disappointed because again, my my mom raised us in a lawnmower factory. That lawnmower factory picked up and left and went to Mexico. Mm. So she ain't had no job. We had lost our house. We would, you know, oh, we, wow. we we grew up in a little small house. So you felt the pressure. Yeah, I felt the pressure. Like you know, like whatever I was going to be getting or signing is like, man, my family need me right now. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, my mama don't have nothing and no prospects right now. There's no jobs in any of the Mississippi. And you know, I'm and I'm showing your mind up. that that 12th grade coach was saying, you, you can go in the NFL. You're going to make the NFL. You're probably thinking, man, yeah. you told me I can make the NFL. Yeah. I mean, I was disappointed, you know. And then what really hit me hard is like the Buffalo Bills called me uh, and they were like, yeah, man, we don't think you're going to get drafted, but if you, know, if you don't, then, you know, we want to be able to bring you in as, like, an undrafted free agent. And that just kind of, like, killed me. Like, dude, mm, I was – kill you? Because, like, you again – to go to Buffalo? Yeah, I mean, going to Buffalo would have sucked. Yeah, yeah, going to Buffalo would have sucked. But you're in the NFL, so it's like, yeah. but going to Buffalo would have sucked. Absolutely. Because it's cold – and like, and that's probably that probably would have been the furthest I ever been away from home. So I ain't one with Buffalo at all. Yeah. Uh, and then like, you know, again, um, my, <coughs> my family was in a tough place at that time. So I'm thinking, you know, signing bonus gonna be this or that, and you know, so I can do this for my mom. I can t- take care of this. Uh, so when they called me, honestly, I like I left out the house. I was sitting in the car and I was crying like a baby. Cause I was like, man. When Buffalo called you. When Buffalo called me. Cause like, what, year, what year was this then? That was two thousand and one. Wow. Okay. Uh, it was Michael Vick, Drew Brees was oh. in that draft. Uh, Drew Brees probably the only one still playing at this point. Um, but yeah, I was I was devastated, man. Cause I was like, dude, you know, if you're an undrafted free agent, you know, they might give you five grand or something to sign. You know, I'm thinking, man, I need like a hundred grand. You know, yeah. like, fuck, cause my family don't have nothing right now. Yeah. Uh, so I was I was I was distraught, and then uh, you know my mom. I was in the car crying. My mom called me. My mom came outside because my phone rung. Uh, you had a cell phone. Yeah, I had a cell phone. Yeah, okay. I had I had a Nokia. Yeah, I had, I had that. You know the little red, the little red the Nokia. No, the little oh, red, the one, one? little red one with the buttons on it. Yeah, yeah. it was screen. You know, wasn't no smartphone. <laughs> oh, yeah, we had smartphones back then. Yeah. It was just you know I was that was my first cell phone ever. So, you know, she came out, and, and I, you know, my middle name, Rashad. Uh, she was, and everybody in my family called me Rashad. So she was like, Rashad, Coach Dungey is on the phone. Mm. And I was like, yeah, I had tears in my eyes, man. I forgot Coach yeah. Dungey was yeah. the coach. Yeah, Coach right? Dungey was the head coach there. So uh, she brought me the phone. Uh, and coach Dungey was like, yeah, man, we're going to take you here, uh, you know, with this, with this next pick. Uh, you know, just want you to, you know, uh, you know, congratulations. Uh, hope you just come in and ready to work. And, you know, if you, if you, you know, you, if you do what you're supposed to do, you have an opportunity to earn a roster spot. Uh, and, again, I was like, you know, tears in my eyes. Went from one moment where I was crying because I didn't think I was going to get drafted because Buffalo was, like, talking about undrafted free agent to having Coach Tony Dungy call me wow. personally and so, talk to so, me so and tell me he's going to take let's, me. Let's, let's expand on that. So what's the difference between an undrafted free agent and then being in the sixth round? Because still nothing is guaranteed to, to you regardless, though, right? Uh, nothing's guaranteed. I mean, the earlier you get drafted, the more money they have, money to, they the, have to it, the more money they invest in you the more they want to kind of keep you around. Because, you know, they if they give you five grand, you know, or don't give you nothing and just give you an opportunity to come in and say, we're going to give you a hotel so right. you can come in and train, like, they cut you. And it's like, you know, it's no much, no fuss. Like, but, but you were six, though, right? I was a six-round pick. I think I got, like, 60 grand to sign. Oh, okay. Um, and, again, when you're – and they cut six-round picks. They cut seven-round. They cut fifth-round oh, picks. You know, the, the, the third – Probably third, maybe fourth is when they'll, you know, they had to make a couple hundred grand, half a million dollar investment in you. Like, you know, they want to keep you around when they make that kind of investment. 60 grand, you know, there's nothing to them. You know, it's like, ah, we cut them. So, but I came in um, and they were a veteran group and they had just lost uh, in the NFC championship game against the Rams. And all of those players were coming back. 
Uh, so, um, you know, I did, it wasn't a they, – they weren't drafting a lot because the defense was strong. They weren't drafting mm-hmm. a lot of defensive players. Uh, so I came in. Uh, you know, I tell people – Warren Sapp. Yeah. It was uh, Sapp, Derek uh, Brooks. Derek Brooks. Simeon Rice was a huge mentor for me. Yeah. Uh, John Lynch, who runs the Ooh. 49ers right now. Ronde Barber. Uh, yeah. You know, you great – I played with some dogs. Yeah. I played with some real. Like, I played with some Hall of Fame guys, man. I mean, was Mike Allstock on? Mike, that? yeah, Mike okay, was there. So still there. Mike, okay. Mike was there. Um, Warwick, Warwick Dunn was still there. Uh, so yeah, man, we had you know Redell Anthony and them guys, uh, Jaquez Green, and them dudes from you know, them receivers from Florida. They were still there when I got there. So it was. Um, uh, I tell people like I could have got drafted higher, and say I had a friend that got drafted to the Broncos. And he talked about like how the veteran players would like tell him to go the wrong way, yeah, or you know do stuff to kind of poison or just kind of you know try to make him mess up. His coach wasn't really encouraging, kind of beat him down, talk crazy to him all the time. Yeah. Oh, wow. So he got drafted into a losing culture. So it didn't mm. allow him to have a career. Mm. Like he was a third round pick, but he got drafted into a place that really didn't like really didn't develop him as a player. I got drafted in Tampa where the culture was, hey, there is a standard, and you meet that standard. And everybody in the room meets this standard. So nobody's trying to sabotage you. like. And then they're playing for a championship. So they're looking for people that can help them win a championship because they're a touchdown away from playing in the Super Bowl the year before. Mm-hmm. So I came into a winning culture that was built by Tony Dungy. Uh, Rob Marinelli was my D-line coach. He's the D coordinator for the Cowboys right now. Mike Tomlin, head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers, was our DB coach. Oh, shoot. I didn't uh, know that. You know, so, like, that was that was Coach Tomlin's first job from, um, oh, what school? He was at, he was at his alma mater uh, coaching DBs, and Coach Dungey gave him his first job in the NFL as a DB coach. Hmm. Uh, so I came into winning culture, bro, and they, they taught me how to work, and they taught me how to win on that level uh, again. Derrick Brooks in the Hall of Fame, Warren Sapp in the Hall of Fame, Tony Dungeons in the Hall of Fame, uh, John Lynch been nominated for Hall of Fame, Simeon Rice been nominated, Rundy Barber been nominated. Like all these guys were on our defense, uh, and so the culture was like, you know, it was a standard, and you, you either met it or you weren't there. Uh, but everybody tried to support you because it was about building a team. And in other places, it's about hey, I'm trying to secure my check. So Mm -hmm. if you look like, as a young player, you can come in and do my job for cheap, especially me as a six-round pick. Mm -hmm. So if you're a veteran guy and you're looking for, you know, two or three million dollars to do this job, Mm -hmm. but then I come in as a six-round pick and I look like I could do the same job for 200000 Yeah. It's like they don't want you to come in and, like, show you can do that job. Mm -hmm. Right. But and you, we had veteran guys like that that were you know that were on there at the end of their first contract looking for that second one, but they all still were like, dude, we're trying to win, so nobody's telling me to go the wrong way. Right. Like nobody's you know trying to sabotage me. They all they did was help and support and push me and hold me accountable. So I got a chance to learn how to be a pro when other guys went into other situations, and it just wasn't that environment. Mm-hmm. Like if I would have got drafted somebody somewhere else. I might have made it two or three years, right? Yeah. There, I had a six-year run in Tampa because of the culture, and you know, I just and I just worked my butt off. And look, and well, with that, Ellis. So when you signed in two thousand one, uh, a lot of people don't realize your first game was against Dallas. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, postseason game, and y'all won uh, that very first game against them, ten to six. But then two days later, nine eleven hit. Yeah. What went through everybody's mind? Were y'all like, man, are we even going? Are we going to be out for a while? I mean, nine one one was big. Man, I tell you, I remember exactly where I was. Um, we were on Tuesdays. Tuesday, we all, yeah. You, you know, we always had to go out. You know, it's day off uh, league wide in the NFL. Mm-hmm. So especially for the young guys, you got to go out and do community service. So we were at a children's hospital. Yeah. Uh, in St. Pete. Okay. Uh, and going from room to room, visiting kids, you know, mm-hmm. just, you know, you know, bringing them toys, talking to them, taking pictures. Uh, and then we saw it on the screen, mm-hmm. like going from room to room. So every room that we went in, we were just kind of looking. So we saw the first plane hit. It's like, man, that's crazy. Yeah. Right? It was yeah. like, you know, and then we going from room to room, going to room to room, and then the next plane hit. 
And honestly, like when I left, I had to go across the bridge mm. to get back to Tampa. Yeah. <laughs> like I was scared. Yeah. <laughs> like I was scared. Yeah, you was yeah. thinking true lies. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking like, man, like these people just crashing planes all over the country. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah. I'm on a bridge, you know what I'm saying? I got I to gotta cross in this, and the airport, bridge yeah, in the, in the bridge, in the airport right there on the other side of Tampa. So it's like planes coming in the horizon. <laughs> so I'm going across the bridge, like, I'm like going 100, like, I got to get across this bridge. Yeah. But it was like a, a, like a cloud over the entire country, even though it was happening in New York. Yeah, yeah. Like, I was scared to death, yeah. like, go, going back over that bridge at that time, because it was happening at that time. So, right. yeah, I'll never forget that day. <laughs> and look, and because of that, so being at that second game got pushed back. Um, we went to week 18. Mm -hmm. And in week 18, uh, y'all had to make up that game against the Eagles. Mm -hmm. And during that time, like, you know, they were like, yo, y'all clinch it anyway, whether you were the <coughs> Eagles, whether y'all won or lost, y'all were, were in it. So that game, from what I'm reading, they didn't play none of the starters. Mm -hmm. Um, y'all yep. were locked in no matter what. Yep. So I'm sure were you getting a lot of playing time then? Were you? Oh, dude, I, uh, I, you know, my fr my my rookie year in the NFL, like I had a really good preseason. Yeah. So, and you know, you get down to final cuts, and, and you know, I if they can hide you, they'll put you on the practice squad. If they feel like we want to keep you for the future, mm -hmm. but we don't want nobody else to be able to sign you. So, mm -hmm. you know, so, so they'll, put you on the they'll, squad. They'll, they'll put you on the practice squad if they don't feel like anybody else wants you, right? Because another team can always pick you up off the practice squad. Right. But if you're on the roster, they can't. Mm -hmm. Now, my luck, they had a defensive end, um, uh, J uh, Johnny Mack. We call him Johnny Mack. Uh, tall white dude. White dude, like, you know, 6'4", like 270. But he played the gunner on the punt team. Like, so you're talking about a guy 6'4", 6'5", 270 that could run. Uh, and play all the special teams. So he was going to be on the roster. Last preseason game, he broke his hip. Oh. Mm. So it opened the roster spot. Oh wow. So my my rookie year ended up being kind of like a red shirt year because I had a great preseason. They didn't want to put me on the practice squad because they didn't want nobody else to come pick me up. So I was on the roster uh, the entire season. Uh, but I've never really dressed, right? It was like, you know, I, I practiced all week. Uh, I took all the practice reps that did nobody want to take, like, mm -hmm. and sapping them dudes. You know, they get to a point where, like, you know, they like, man, Dub, you got that. You Dub, go take, go take them reps. <laughs> so I, on Wednesdays and Thursdays, those work days in the NFL, I worked my butt off. Uh, but that was a rest year for me. So that game was, like, I had to play. Yeah. And I played the entire game. Dude, I almost died. Because <laughs> I ain't played the whole season, right? Yeah. Dude, honestly, it was some, it was some game because I knew I wasn't dressing. So, on Sundays, I was chilling because it's like, so I would come to the stadium, dude, like I have like a little a little cup of Hennessy in the car. Yeah. Like driving up to the stadium, you know, because yeah. I'm about to watch yeah. some NFL football. I got best seats in the house. Like I'm standing on the sideline, yeah. but I know I ain't dressing. Yeah. So I'm just practicing. So most of the year, dude, I'm coming up to the, you know, I'm coming up to the game a little tipsy. Yeah. Then, then one time, I remember Steve White, he was sitting next to me. Yeah. He sniffed. He was like, boy, you been drinking? I was like, what you mean? He was like, boy, you been drinking? I'm like, I had a little something, something. He was like, man, don't do that. You never know. What if one of us get in a car accident? You might have to play. Mm. Like, I was like, I don't know, man. I ain't dressed all year. So, you know, I used to come in, you know, this, you know, little, little, you know, it was a red shirt. But that game right there, dude, I almost died. Because I had to play every rep. And them dudes sitting over there like, we ain't playing. So, yeah. they dress, but they ain't playing. Right. So, I, they just, I probably played 60 snaps in that game. Dude, I almost died. That was one of the hardest days of my life. And who's playing against the and Eagles? That was the, the Eagles. Eagles. And look, and that was a close game. Y'all lost 17 to 13. That yep. was a close That's game. That's what, Deuce Staley? Yeah, yeah Deuce Staley. McNabb. Yeah, McNabb. Yeah, McNabb. Yeah, McNabb. Yeah, we played them. Uh, and we were going to be playing them again the next week in the playoffs anyway. Yeah, that's what I was going to get to. Because yeah. the next week after y'all lost to them, but y'all were locked in regardless, Think y'all were y'all six or third? I want to say we were six. And then Eagles had, was third in we their had to division. Go to Philly. Yeah. yeah, so now it's the wild card. And y'all yeah, played the Eagles card. again. Yeah. But now the starters and the airways playing and that loss was thirty one to nine. Do you remember that game and what happened? Um I, I think um I mean I think we just uh like Coach Dungey, uh 
like he, he came from <coughs> like the 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 Chuck Noll school, you know, old Pittsburgh Steelers coach, mm. and we practiced really really hard. And I remember that week, uh, like you know, the run drill that we do in the NFL is called nine on seven. You know, it's just you just come out and it is 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 nine offensive players versus seven defensive players, and they're only running the ball. Mm. And this is like a work day drill, like pad it up, like playing the run game. So it's, it's not pro- Oklahoma. Yeah, it ain't Oklahoma, <laughs> but it's almost like that because you know it ain't. It, it's just run game. It ain't no play action. They ain't throwing the ball. It's I run game. That. So okay. it's very physical, right? So, but Coach Dungey felt like you know we needed to get ready to be physical. And most of the NFL at that time was done practicing in pads in like week ten, week eleven, mm-hmm. maybe you know because you get to a certain point in the in the you season. To your body. Yeah, so you take the pads off. Mm-hmm. But Coach Dungey was just hard nosed and old school. I didn't know that. Dude, man, we that's the hardest I've ever worked in my life. Really? Like practicing for Coach Dungey. Cause again, we were well, going he's soft off the field, like in an uh it's, prime time. I'm thinking, okay. Dude, he was so he never had to raise his voice to be hard. Like he just set the agenda and that's what we were gonna do. And we had players complaining, Hall of Fame players that were like, Man, we gotta do nine on seven, dude. This week one of the playoffs. Like we got a team that ain't had pads on in two months. Right. We still out here banging. And Coach Dungeon was like, I hear what y'all are saying, but I feel like we need to do this to get ourselves ready to play this game. We got to be physical. We got to be low. We got to be ready to go out. Because we were a power running team, and our defense was just get off the ball and just dominate people. So he Is that fu- why he was out? I think he ended up um, I think he ended up being out because, honestly, he was very loyal to his coaches. Uh, and I think they kind of wanted him to move on from the offensive staff and do something different with the offense because the offense couldn't score points. Right. The so defense was dominant. Yeah, like Brad. <laughs> no, not at, at, uh, that, at sh- that. Was it Trent? Or? At that time, uh, it was, I want to say, Sean King and well, I can't think of who. It was two of them, Sean King and I can't think of who the other quarterback was. I think Rob Johnson, I think. Rob Johnson from the Bills, I think. Yeah, but uh, so the offense, like, struggled, you know, and it was like an Achilles heel of a championship defense. Uh, and But Coach, Coach Dungy, I mean, he left, he went to Indy, and he took all of those same coaches with him. But you go to Indy, you got, you know, you got a Peyton Manning. So, you know, you don't, your offensive staff is important, but not as important as when, you know, Sean King, great guy, he not Peyton Manning. Nah. Yeah. No. I mean, but, okay, the following year, Y'all won the Super Bowl, right? Mm-hmm. And the defense, I mean, the offense still was trash, too, because I remember. All right, hold on, hold on. Actually, let me let me bring that up since you okay. say that. So, in, in the next year, y'all went 12-4 and four mm-hmm. in the regular season. Y'all made it to the Super Bowl, and now y'all going to play against the Raiders. Mm-hmm. Now, what made that different was the first time ever they said that the number one offensive team, the Raiders, faced against the number one defensive team. Y'all mm-hmm. are the number one defensive team. That's never mm-hmm. happened before they said, and John Grudden was the head coach of the Raiders three years before that. The year and now, before. Yeah, in the last the three years before, before yeah. that. Yeah, and now and now he's the Tampa head coach mm-hmm. yeah. for y'all now. And the Raiders had a four-point uh, favorite over y'all. Yeah, yeah. But uh, mentally and physically, like you are saying, how is that be? you know, you're looking at them being the number one offensive team. And y'all the number one defensive team. Mentally and physically, like, what's going through your I, mind? I, I, knew, I knew John Gruden gave y'all, gave y'all inside of, uh, what's it called? He had to. Yeah, I mean, of, yeah, I mean he, he, he definitely, I'll say this. Like, when the back end maybe, like with the DBs, like some of the information, some of the tails or something, you know, some of the tendencies of the offense, those guys are going to look at that more. Yeah. Uh, I Like, the, the last day of Super Bowl practice, Coach Gruden actually like ran the two minute drill, like he was the quarterback for the two minute drill. Okay. Uh, you no know, Friday, the Friday practice. The so Friday practice is usually you know it's not it's no pass, not as physical. Guys are running around, but it's not full tilt. So he ran the two minute drill, and he actually shredded us. Like Coach Gruden, like actually, he had an arm back yeah, what? like he okay. shredded us, like completing passes, coming up to the line of scrimmage, calling the play, snap, man, bam, like he shredded us. So he was running the playbook that he instilled in Oakland. Yeah, same and stuff. Then, that's what I'm saying. So y'all yeah. had insider, y'all, because I will say, I always it. felt that because I'm like, man, the way y'all played it, because I remember that Super Bowl. Yeah, man, the way y'all played is sort of like you knew 
what was going to happen. They won 48 to 21. Yeah. yeah like, I, I feel like... It's more than film at that point, man. Uh, I, I think the film study was, was big. I think, honestly, a lot of what they did wasn't really complex. You know, like, they ran this thing a lot called Sluggo Scene. Like, where... You know they're gonna they're gonna run a they're gonna run like a a, a backside kind of skinny post, so that's like the sluggo, uh -huh. all right. Where they want to and he's gonna pump fake that sluggo to get the safety to move, all right. And then he's gonna come back to the seam route, all right. So and they've been killing people with that all year, yeah. all right. So you watch our tape where <coughs> they run the sluggo scene, one of the the the. the uh, the, the the interception Dexter Jackson who end up being Super Bowl MVP yeah. they run the sluggo they pump the, the skinny post he don't move all right and then he come back and try to hit that scene Dex pick it off all right so you could like they kind of stayed with some of their tendencies mm -hmm. not that our guys didn't get information from John right. but one of the things you when you go into a game you don't want to be guessing. Right. Like, because if you guess wrong, <laughs> you get burned and you get gassed. And that's the one thing about our defense was, like, we're going to keep everything in front of us and make you check it down. Right. And whoever you check it down to, we're going to punish them. Right. But we're not going to let you beat us over top. We're not going to let you get chunk yardage on us. They didn't have a running back either. They so. had Charlie Gardner, and but Charlie was – Man, no. Charlie, Charlie had a hell of a year that year, yeah, though. Okay, but they were the number one offense in the league. Yeah, what they passing offense. What, what they had uh -huh. is they had a Wiley veteran in, in, in Rich Gannon at Rich quarterback. Gannon, yeah. They had Jerry Rice and Tim Brown at receiver, which were veteran guys. Uh, but we were younger uh, with our corners, and they couldn't block us up front. Um, and, again, they kind of beat people – with doing the same things like the entire year, they didn't really change it up. I definitely feel like John probably gave us some insider information. But I'm a defensive lineman. I don't care about no inside information. All I want, all I'm thinking is, I got gut this dude in front of me. Like this dude in front of me, I got to beat him. Behind me, and then Derrick Brooks, one of the smartest players ever. Like was valedictorian of his high school class, valedictorian at Florida State. Like super smart, intelligent guys, film study. So, like, you're not going to get anything past him. past him. And so we just had, like, again, John Lynch, super smart guy. Uh, Ronnie Barber, super smart guy. Like, you know, uh, Brian Kelly, Sean Core is a Vanderbilt graduate. Guy that came in from, you know, CFL and, uh, and, and NFL Europe and earned his way as the starting Mike linebacker on a championship defense. Like, super smart guy. Hard. So we, we didn't have a lot of guys on the back end they were just out there running around with their hair on fire. Like, we would knock the crap out of people, but all them guys were super smart. Yeah. Yeah. And look, so in that Super Bowl game, uh, you got a sack on a quarterback, Rich mm -hmm. Cannon, and you had three tackles. How did it feel that game? Man, honestly, playing in the Super Bowl is like a dream come true. Like, even just coming out of the tunnel is like, you know, it's like a dream because it's like, it's, it's what you work for your whole life, it's what you've seen on TV. Uh, it's like when you're playing scenarios in your head when you're a kid, counting down, you know, the, the winning touchdown, like you're in the Super Bowl. So uh, to be in San Diego, to come out of that stadium, have my mom there, my family there, uh, and to be able to play on that stage, to know everybody who's probably ever known you in life is watching you in that moment yeah. um, was just, you know, amazing. Just the whole week and all the, the pageantry around around the game. Uh, it's just it's, it's something that tell people playing in the NFL and living an experience like that, there's nowhere else on the planet where you can go and relive that. Uh, it's truly a gladiator sport, and we made it to you know the top of the sport. Uh, and, but I'll honestly say, again, I always tell people, like, I got a chance to play with some great players, and those guys kind of built a culture that I could come in and be a part of. Uh, and, again, getting a chance to get a sack in the Super Bowl, make tackles in the Super Bowl, uh, just to even get on the field, man, was Especially like. Especially taking down a quarterback. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, get it. I mean, that year, you know, my my thing was uh, what 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 made what gave me an opportunity to be a pro was I was versatile. And yeah. you come in as a six round pick, like you got to prove like your worth to this team. Mm -hmm. So anytime Coach Marinella was like, man, we need a nose guard. I got it. We need a right end. I got it. You need three tech. Mm -hmm. I got it. Like. And I could do everything. So we got to a point where they did an article about me in the Tampa newspaper. It was like an army on one. 
Like I was oh, every wow. I, I got a chance to play with some great players and those guys kind of built a culture that I could come in and be a part of. Uh, and again, getting a chance to get a sack in the Super Bowl, make tackles in the Super Bowl, kind of carved out a, a, a niche for me where, you know, if somebody got hurt or something, it's like usually, man, we got to go out here on the street and see can we find somebody that can do this, who available in free agency, well, Ellis can do it. Like, mm-hmm. but that's it, that's having the intelligence to be able to not only learn the playbook, but learn all of the techniques that go with the p- playbook and the alignments that go with the playbook and the, and the zone drops and the zone blitzes and, and, and just everything that encompasses the defense, the movements and, and how you. So I was able to go in and learn all that and be able to do all that at every spot on our defense. So I've, I've gotten a sack in the NFL at every position. From nose guard, right in, left in, three so technique. How, how big were you when you were in the NFL? Probably like uh like like two eighty five, like six 285. four, like two eighty five. So again, I was and I was a basketball player yeah. uh in high school. So like I can move. So like I and it's very easy for me. Like I could look at Sap and watch how he did that and then process it and be like, Okay, do it like that. Cause Sap had technique, he wasn't that Oh big. yeah, was a monster was an absolute monster. Like, I watched Warren Sapp dominate practices. I watched him, like, and Sapp, you know, he um, he's, he has a reputation for not being the nicest guy in the world. And he is not. Like, he is not. Like, some people, most people who don't know him will actually call him an asshole because he can be a total asshole to people. Yeah, he yeah, can. Yeah. And he know that, right? Uh, but... As far as football character, yeah. like, I watched him lead our group every day. And he was the culture of that team. Like, he was the lifeblood of everything we did because he dominated. And he bought, like, pregame, like, you know, we come out in pregame, whoever we playing, right? 9-9 going to walk to the middle of the field, kind of spin his helmet in the middle of the field, and talk shit to the other team and let them know it's a war today. Like, <laughs> In the middle of, like, pregame, he coming out in the middle of the field at the 50, yeah. spin that helmet on the 50-yard line and let them know, hey, <laughs> it's a war. It's about to go down. Yeah. Like, that was the culture of the team. Like, he was that guy. He set that tone. He set the tone, which yeah. a lot of times these days when you watch defenses, they don't have a guy like that that's just a goon. Yeah. But he also, talent-wise, elite. Uh, 9-9 was super smart, like, process information like a computer. Wow. And, but people – you know, didn't like him. Like, I I, I view him from a different uh, perspective because he's my teammate, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. So, and he was a mentor to me yeah. and taught me how to play, told me how to do this, showed me how to watch this way and how you do this and what you're looking for. So, I got a relationship where, like, he kind of taught me a lot. Yeah. Not just with football, just with a lot of different stuff, man. Super smart dude, but he can be very difficult to deal with. Mm. And if you don't know him, like he can crush your feelings, right? He can crush your feelings. Like you, you can he can piss you off. He piss people off all the time. I watch him have arguments. I watch people come to the point where they want to punch him in the face. Yeah, because he's an asshole. Yeah, but he was our asshole. Yeah, right. And he was yeah, the, he was the engine yeah. that drove everything that we did. And then Simeon Rice came in just as just an elite pass rusher and elite talent. Uh, Kobe, uh Sim. Brought like a Kobe Bryant mentality to pass rushing. Mm. Like he outworked everybody. He was in the best shape of his life at all times and was meticulous about the skill development. Like he knew exactly what he was going to do and how he was going to do it. So you got one of the greatest pass rushers of all time at defensive end, one of the greatest pass rushers of all time at three technique. Like for me, I just got to make sure again as a, as as the guy as the the guy um, that. I was the kind of the glue guy that could make things fit because those two those two guys are dominant personalities, dominant athletes. So how, how did that, how they did that bump work? heads let's, all the time. Let's, let's talk about this locker room situation. So, okay, um, you have Simeon Rice and then you have Warren Sapp, and like you said, they bumped heads. Yeah. Okay. Uh, two uh, two elite players and two two players that had like the ultimate confidence in themselves yeah. and two guys that felt like they were the best player on the field no matter where we went like on the planet they felt like they were the best uh, and Warren kind of saw the game and how we should do things football wise his way 
And Simeon just always moved by the beat of his own drum. Like he never conformed to anything. Like he was just like, I'm going to be great when I show up. I'm going to dominate like the, 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 the football, some of the football culture things. Yeah. He just never really adhered to. He just kind of did his own thing. Uh, and when you say culture, what do you mean? Some of the football culture? Uh, uh, just some of the like some of the 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 bravado toughness stuff. Uh, you know the, you know the the you know making sure like we're all dressed alike and you know like uh, you know if if the coach want everybody on the team to do this a certain way like to show up in a suit like Sam ain't showing up in no suit. Yeah. Like he don't wear suits. <laughs> he like the Allen Iverson. Yeah. He coming in his he regular clothes. He coming in his regular, and it might be some you know uh, a, a, a fresh you know European style leather jacket, yeah. some jeans with some hoops. Like that? Uh, not jewelry wise. Oh, okay. Just just from a style standpoint, like he was always just different mm -hmm. than everybody else. His persona, his mentality about things was just always different. Like he was he, <laughs> from Chicago, but from Chicago in a sense where. It was like the fly side of Chicago, yeah. oh, like the Kanye West side oh, of Chicago, okay. yeah. where it's like I don't fit in with everybody else. <laughs> yeah. But I'm the best. But I'm the they best player on the field. It don't all, work. Man. Yeah, it don't. I talk about. I talk yeah. about like because I mean I try to give Sean um, inside the football culture, right? Yeah. I always talk about culture is good, yeah right. Even within different teams, different teams have cultures, but. Within football in general, no matter what level you play, they always try to have a military culture. Yeah. And and, and I always say military slash uh, slave, master, and then you're the slaves, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And because um, my high school coach didn't want you to have sideburns. Mm -hmm. uh, we always had to have two socks, white tube socks. Yeah. You couldn't have braids, no yeah. locks. Yeah. Uh, well, he grew to let you have the mustache, but your mustache had to be cut precise, right? Yeah. And then just, man, and you had to have the fade. And then so, uh, and I just found that, like, you know, a lot of coaches were like that, man. Yeah. I and, mean, you know, you had to be at the field house. He was the Tom Coughlin. Yeah. Uh, of, of, of my high school, of my district. Yeah. Where he was like, man, hey. Five minutes early is on time. If you on time, you too late. Yeah, <laughs> and see, late, and see, you Sam, <laughs> Sam couldn't, Sam couldn't have played for Tom Coughlin because oh, yeah. Sam kind of does his own thing. And again, he gonna show up in better shape than anybody at all. Like he's never a point where he like not in shape. So was he a break Madonna? Um, you may some people may call him that. Man, I didn't, I, yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't get that. Some people may him, call right? him that, but I mean the coolest dude in the world. And honestly. Like, again, a guy that took me under his wing, like, you know, we like we go through practice, you know, practice two, two and a half hours. I'm exhausted. This dude in the best shape of his life, one of the most elite athletes I've ever been around. So after practice, that's when practice starts for him. Like, and he wow. got, and he out here for another hour and a half, two hours, running sprints, running 200s, working like uh, skill development, hands, feet, where you're looking at. So he kind of pulled me in, and then after, after practice, he's like, Ellis, let's go. Let's go get this work, right? So... I'm working, hands, feet. We talking about pass rush angles. Okay, what you see when you do this. Okay, if you see me turn, you come here. If I see you turn, I go there. Like, kind of kind of talk. He pulled me in. So, again, he was a huge mentor for me. Mm. But I also kind of made myself a little bit, you know, I could fit in anywhere, yeah. right? But because you're, you're working with the guy that's kind of the outlier, because you got to think about Sap and Brooks and all these guys, they built that culture, yeah, right? Yeah, they yeah. they took it from the yucks to the bucks, yeah. right? Because they they went they was there with the cream sickle when they was garbage. <laughs> they was garbage, like that was sapping Brooklyn. They wore them cream sickles with with the buckle with buckle Bruce <laughs> yeah. on the side. They wore them, so they took it from that to to them dudes that's in them red pewter and red jerseys yeah. that's mowing the league down. Me and Sim got there the same year, yeah. right? I was drafted. He was signed as a free agent from Arizona. Deal again. See, like Joe Green, me Joe Green, old school. Yeah. Sim, you know, Sim might show up to practice. Sneakers ain't really tied, you know. He got, <laughs> you know, like he the jersey pulled up. He shredded. So me Joe, he wasn't like the Deacon Jones type like that he was used to with yeah. the least player. So 
he ain't really vibe with Sam a lot. You know, he's like he. So when Sam left there, he kind of had that that stigma about again not really fitting in the football culture. With with Coach Marinelli, he told me the first day. People talk about what's a good guy. Like a good guy to me is a guy that can rush. I don't give a damn what you do outside of this place. I don't give a damn about your attitude. If you show up and you win one on one rushes, you are a great guy to me. So Simeon Rice torture one on one rushes. Like he mow down any tackle in the league. Pro Bowl, all millennium, Orlando Pace, Jonathan Ogden, all these dudes. See him, bam, 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 go. Like chop him up. So. He elite, he just wasn't in, like the football culture guy. He kind of did his own <laughs> thing, you know? You know, that puts me in mind of uh, uh, earlier, uh, Olu was telling me about, um, he said, we got to ask about Antonio Brown. What were some of the things about Antonio Brown? So did Antonio sign today with the, with the Saints? I'm not sure. I didn't see it. I, I think no, I they said they somewhere. said they can't he can't sign yet until the NFL clears him. Um, but they said, is, he, they said he had a great workout. Yeah. With the Saints, and he really impressed them. And one of the things that uh, that they talked about also is they said they told him don't come with no entourage. And what did he do? He came with he came the entourage. entourage. And but they said, but as far as his performance, did great. But they said it's up in the air. Even though he looked good, um, he can't sign until all those allegations and things are clear. No, 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 no. no. He can, he could sign. He just he don't know if he can play. No, 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 no. Like, he can play because the NFL hasn't said anything yet. Like, mm-hmm. they didn't put him on the exempt list. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I could be wrong, but we could double check that. Now, what I read today, they said he can't sign until he gets cleared through the NFL. Oh, so why? Now, he can try out and work out. And they said, you know, it, if it gets cleared, say. Because it's not going to be cleared anytime. Soon. Right. So, they're saying more than likely he'll be able to play with them next season. More than likely. Oh. Well, they probably want to have him for the playoffs, but I'll say this by Antonio. Um, um, he's. Um, he would be, uh, could be a disruption and a distraction in a locker room. Uh-huh. Uh, he's a guy, like, you still got to have some level of a control over your mouth right. and the things you say and the things you do and the things you tweet, yeah. uh, the pictures you take. Because, again, this is our locker room. This is a private but see, place. But you played in a different era, though. Yeah. See, and that's what I was saying, like, I mean, if you would have never told me that about Simeon Rice, I would have never knew. Yeah. Right? So, because your era was pre social, social media. media. Yeah. So, how would you, like, how would somebody, how would, like, uh, how would you just deal with that? How would the locker room just be if y'all would have had social media? It would have been tougher. It would have been, it's tougher for all athletes now. Uh, you know, because one, I mean, I think a lot of them feel like they have to share things on social media. They don't necessarily have to, but some of them feel like they have to. But even if you're not sharing, like, just walking around in your everyday life, somebody's going to take a picture of you and, and put it on Instagram. Oh, man, that was Deshaun Watson over here at this restaurant. Or, you know, that was, you know, that was J.J. Mm-hmm. Watt. Like, so you're always under a microscope and mm-hmm. everything you do you anywhere be can be filmed. Or taking a picture of and be manipulated and given to the world and be manipulated. Even if it's not manipulated, yeah. you can't like be a guy at a bar just chilling. Yeah. Or if you're a guy that like to go to strip clubs. Yeah. And oh, they gonna or, get you. Or you're somewhere <laughs> like you know you 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 ain't always been in the NFL and you got friends in the trap. Yeah. And you want to holler at your homeboys out here standing on the corner. Mm. Somebody bam okay. And, oh, he over here, what is happening? Oh, he over here about this, a known crack right, house. Right, blah, blah, blah. You know, like, right. you can't move in the world mm-hmm. as a normal person because people care about what you do. And everything that you do reflects on your team's brand and the NFL brand. Uh, so that's a tough environment for these young dudes to exist in, I, I think, from, from that standpoint. Where Antonio, um, it's like certain things you do, like certain things you understand guys got social media. But there are going to be boundaries of things that you don't tweet, you don't like certain conversations, you do, are private conversations, right? I'm having a. Juju Smith. Yeah, if I'm having a private conversation with you over text, then don't tweet that out. You know, don't record me talking to you. And then, because we, we all have an a, a obligation to the brand and what we put out that represents our brand, the team's brand, and the NFL brand. But everything we say and do is not going to be flattering for the brand. But you see, I, I, I think that that's what, like, uh, like me and Sean talk about this all the time. And, and I feel what hurts the NFL players is that 
the culture of the NFL, right? Of the conservative culture, mm-hmm. right? Now, I'm not going to defend A.B. because some of the stuff that he does and says, I just can't defend it. Yeah. But I understand, okay, he wants to build a brand because you're not going to – this game ain't going to last forever, right? Yeah. So I don't see nothing wrong with, you know, building a brand or having your own shoe, your own designer shoe, sort of like how Michael Jordan, you know – what we know is Jordan now, mm-hmm. when he started wearing Nike, when he started wearing his own socks, his own shoes, when he first got into the league, oh, he had, Nike had to shell out fines yeah. for that. But the NFL doesn't allow that. You guys have a strict code, yeah. dress code, you know, and it already hinders you that people can't see your face. All they know is your number mm-hmm. and your name in the back of your jersey. But I think that he was trying to build a brand bigger uh, than... Um, I don't. I don't want to necessarily say the team, but he wants to put it, you know, on a pedestal where the yeah. NFL is the shield first, then the teams, and then you know they have certain people that they put in the spotlight. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, well, AB now. Now, I feel like the stuff that he did actually hurt his brand. Of course. Like the stuff that he he like, and again, AB was on the cover of Madden, right? right. So like. His performance as a player, even with a lot of the, the antics on the field and stuff, like he was enhancing his brand as a marketable player, as a guy that was fun to come watch, you know, right. guys. Mm-hmm. And then, honestly, you know, in his defense, and I read an article about this, <coughs> uh, uh, it said that his behavior started to deteriorate and decline after he took that headshot from Vontaze Burfick on mm-hmm. Monday Night Football. So there could be some issues where, you know, he's got some damage to his brain. That's CT. Yeah, and he's not able to cuz it seems like he's not able to keep himself from doing or saying certain things right. that are obviously going to hurt you. Like mm-hmm. going into a back and forth with a person that's accusing you of sexual assault over a text message, it's just not smart. Right. right. Yeah, it's insane to do that. Like yeah. that doesn't make sense. So he can't stop himself from doing that. Recording Coach Gruden in a private conversation and then tweeting it mm. is just not smart. Right. It's not like you just don't do like you, you're trying to have a like we're two men talking about how we're going to bring this team together to accomplish a goal. Mm. Like that's why we're there. And I know that's why Coach Gruden's there. Like yeah. Coach Gruden and I know Coach Gruden. Probably don't have no ill will toward A.B. Probably loves A.B. And don't have no problem, you know, like, no no ill will toward him doing that. But you just break down that trust back, you know, when you do something like that. So he's making decisions and some of the things that he does that's kind of hurt his brand and kind of hurts your ability for people to trust you on the team. And, right. and Olu said that he wanted to beat up or fight or fight the coach. Like, who wants to be around you if you the GM? If, the GM. Yeah. And if you and I know you want to punch me. Like now, I don't even want to be around because I don't yeah. know if you're gonna punch me or not. Yeah, like you're unstable. Like you're an unstable human being. Yeah. Like at that point, like that's just irrational behavior. So, I'm. You know, could be some CT. It could be again. They. I, think of that. I, I saw. I saw an article that that showed like when he got hit in the head. Then the Facebook Live thing he did from the locker room in Pittsburgh, which is like ridiculous. Like you don't do that. Like, like you just don't. Like, but you see, but that's what I'm trying to get at, though. You say you don't do that in the NBA. They do that in like the NBA. Okay, the reason why I'm, what I'm trying I, to I, get I, at, let me let me tell let me let me tell you this. Uh huh. When he did it, yeah, Coach Tomlin was talking, yeah. right. Like, when we first get in the locker room and the coach is addressing us after a win, like, there's a time when media comes in. There's a time for all that. When we first come in this locker room and Coach Tomlin is addressing the team, talking about whatever we just did on the field, like, that's our time. That's not for the world. Like, that's our time as a team to talk about this win, to celebrate this win. Like, again, football culture. That's NFL football culture. Now, after we break that, we're going to start letting all the media in. Yeah. So, you want, like, you know, prime time nah. do the, you know, you know, you ball, you get the call. Oh, right. But you ain't going to do ball, you get the call while the head coach talking, okay. right? But, but, but okay, to, to counteract play devil's advocate, right? Mm. So, there's still cameras in there while Coach Tomlin is talking to y'all. Yeah. Because you see him all the time. Mm-hmm. Like the, you know, the a great game, game ball. That's probably CBS. CBS, yeah. right. But why can't Antonio have 
his own camera showing his fans what's going on from his perspective. Because he's part of the team. Like he's part of the team. Like it's not it's a it's a team game. It's not about him at that point. That's what we get back down to football culture and us trying to build something where we're winning like together. So right. when we as a team and this is our moment, like the team prayer before the game. Right. Like we're all there. Right. Like in team meetings, like there are no Facebook live in team meetings. Like right. there's certain times where us as a team, we're together and we're all locked in listening to coach. I coach. Uh, like AAU basketball. Yeah. One of the most irritating things to me is when I'm talking to my team <laughs> yeah. and I got a kid in the back having a whole different conversation different to what I'm talking about. I've seen that. Right? <laughs> you don't do that. Like, yeah. that's disrespectful okay. in that time. And again, he has all the time in the world to build his brand. But in that moment, yeah. that ain't brand building time. But that's you, our but time. You see, that's, that, see that's, my, that's my problem with... Uh, quote the culture of football right? yeah. from uh, elementary all the way up to the league mm -hmm. because the game don't give a damn about you yeah. right and then so man like you sort of need somebody to agitate the culture a little bit mm -hmm. right because and I agree with you there's certain times and places yeah. right now when you step off that field when you secure the victory and then you know he's an important part of that team and he helped that team to get to that point. Now, when you celebrate and everything, if CBS could have their cameras in that in that locker room showing Mike Tomlin, you know, giving a speech, I don't feel that there was anything wrong that he had his camera, you know, pointed at Mike Mike Tomlin. Just as long as nobody's naked or nobody's talking ill about anybody from the other uh, team, mm -hmm. right? I did because I saw the I saw the live footage, and yeah. I didn't feel that there, there was anything wrong with that. I I mean I don't think I don't know I don't know if if Coach Tomlin tripped. Well, okay, but okay, think about this. Okay, if Antonio does it right, mm -hmm. then how about ten players? Right. Then how about Coach Mike Tomlin? He talking, and you got twenty players on Facebook Live. Right. Like oh, uh, you like I want your attention. Stop. So, stop filming. Like, yeah, okay. and it's like again, there's. What we're trying to do as a team, and then there's the outside world. And again, CBS right. is there, but CBS paid billions of dollars to be there. Right. They pay billions of dollars right. to be there. So again, they have the right to be there because everybody's salary in that room is being paid because CBS pays billions of dollars but to be see, there. But see, look, what so, I'm trying to get at is, okay, the disparity between the NBA and the NFL. NFL is much more makes more of a revenue than the NBA, mm -hmm. but the NBA players have more because I'm trying to get to the collective bargaining agreement. Right? Yeah, right. So my thing is, NFL players, football players have no power, and I feel like man, they get as football players on every level get abused yeah. by the people who are in power. Whenever you know when you when you know collectively. You know, you do have the power. And I feel like certain people, like an Antonio uh, Bryant, in a controlled way, can disrupt the, disrupt the status quo and say, okay, man, we're going to change this. I'm going to put the power in my hands. Like, because you're not going to just cut Antonio Bryant off the team anyway, anyhow. No, they will. Yeah, they will. They will. They will. Yeah, they but will. But it's going to come to a certain point. Like, that's what I'm like. I don't think, I don't think the problem when he was recording – Coach Mike Tomlin live, I don't think that's a problem, mm -hmm. right? Now, when you uh, talk a noise about Juju, when you get in that bin, when you're not showing up for practice. The accumulation, got, yeah. The accumulation, right? And the then, major and, stuff. And then you, you, you lose any validity of any point that you're making. And again, with Antonio, but specifically with Antonio, uh -huh. like Antonio is about Antonio. Right. Like he's not trying to do anything to help anybody else improve you know, uh, business or opportunities for other players. And, again, at the end of the day, the billionaires who own those teams are going to be the final decision makers. And I feel like sometimes uh, people forget that, like, these billionaires that own these teams, like, they earn the right to own these teams. Like, nobody really, nobody gave them a billion dollars. Right. Like, they went out and earned, and they earned, they, they paid the cost to be the boss. Right. Uh, now, from a collective bargaining agreement standpoint, again, I'm on the other side of it where 
And again, I can see both sides of it. Like I can see as a former player what the NFL does a lot to try to help and support current and former players mm. in business, in health, uh, in, but you got to have your mind in a place where you can go and sit down and go to a business development uh, program that the NFL is putting on. Or you got to mm-hmm. have yourself in a, in a mindset to go to a, a mental health program and, and get your brain checked and not be in this typical place where, man, that's for them people, right? Because mental health is for them people. It ain't for me, mm-hmm. right? So the NFL does a lot. I don't look at the NFL as this big boogeyman because I know – I can look at where the league grew from, from just a group of men putting together a league, you know, putting together teams, not a bunch of people coming, not these huge contracts, not the $10 billion of business, the year business that it is now, where it was nothing to these men, these billionaires built it to it's the most popular sport in America. Yeah. And I, I guarantee you the NFL has created more black millionaires mm. than probably any other industry in this country now it's not sustainable because again your your career is going to end one day right. but okay. these 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 black men who a lot of times if it wasn't for football like it wasn't for football for me i don't know what i would have been doing right. because of football i got a chance to go to college playing in the nfl i got a chance to get mentored by people like tony dungeon like like rob marinelli like you know i played for monty kiffin Play, you know, play for Mike Holmgren. Play with Warren Sapp. I still got Derek Brooks. You know, it, it, phone. I could text Brooks right now. Like these, like like great men that mm. sold into me, and now I'm a husband and a father. Right. And and the principles that they taught me is going like it, they're going to be in my family from now moving forward. Because right. what I got taught there, mm. I'm giving to my children, and the money I made. The, you know, the, the the I never had a bank account before I got in the NFL, oh, wow. right? I had cash in my hand, right? right yeah. I had go get checks cash, give me my cash in my hand. I never had a bank account, right? So, like, the, the NFL provides so much opportunity. And it's so easy to jump on them because, again, they're the boss. But they pay the cost to be the boss. They get to set what they want for their league, and they give players a lot of opportunity if they're in the right mindset to take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. The problem comes is when you come from an environment that hasn't prepared you for the business side of the sport. Like, you've only been prepared to play it. Right. You haven't understood, like, but uh, that, investments. But that's, but that's my problem with it, though, yeah. right? So, like you said, and most players don't understand that, man, really – it's a business when you in high school and even junior yeah, high. Yeah, they don't know. Like, right? Because I, I understood, man, the high school that I was going to, man, kills a lot of these colleges. I went to a high school where the, the stadium was 50,000. Yeah, yeah. 50, that's, that's crazy. In North Texas. So I knew right then and there it was a business, right? Mm. And then that's when football got less fun to me. Yeah. Um, because I'm like, okay. I'm seeing these boosters, high school boosters. That's crazy. This is my son. He gonna play. And yeah. He gonna play. Yeah. And this dude is pure trash. Yeah. You know, like yeah. you said. And it I take mean, the it take the joy out of it when and, that and, happens. And my high school had forty different jersey combinations. Yeah. Man, that was crazy. I'm like, yeah. whoa, like. And then it only gets bigger and bigger as you go to that next level. Yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah. D one school. But my, my my point that I'm getting is, and this only happens in football, well, what do we get out of that? What do you get out of that as a player? Because you're not getting a fraction of what they seeing, but yet you going out there, you getting CTE, mm-hmm. you 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 um you tearing ACLs, MCLs, you know, who knows how you gonna bounce back. A lot of these coaches, you know, because I come I, I told Sean this, man, I charged after a coach. Mm. For telling me to go back to Africa. Yeah. When I was in high school. Yeah. You know, a lot of these coaches, they mentally dog you down. Yeah. And, you know, I believe that does something to you mentally. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And and we get on Antonio Brown for how he's acting, but that monster was created. Yeah. Because yeah. when you go back to his high uh, talk to his college coaches in high school. They have nothing but positive things to say about him. Mm-hmm. Now I know a guy that was with him at Eastern Michigan. Uh, my my brother in law actually, uh-huh. and 
he said Antonio was off the chain. I mean, Antonio is 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 a kid from the hood in Miami, yeah. right? Uh, and with everything that comes with that, uh, but he's a grown man with children, right? And at, at a certain point in my life, like you know, I'm in from Indianola, Mississippi, right? Mm-hmm. And, and and certain things that I grew up that are part of the culture there, like just don't fit in successful, successful co- culture. Right. And I had to make a decision to change myself. Now, lucky for me. I had the right people around me. Mm-hmm. Now, Antonio, I think he probably has had some of the right people around him, uh, but I don't think he listens. Like, and honestly, I don't think he's Drew, Drew Rosenhaus is his agent. I don't think Drew Ro- Rosenhaus is the person that's going to, like, try to steer players away from doing certain Bad things. Stuff. Yeah, I think he Drew, exploits. he exploits it, right? right. He's going to, like, when, when Antonio got in trouble, he's on ESPN. Right? right, like it's no other time they bring history. him on. He, he has yeah, history of that. so he everybody. Yeah. I don't think he has a person in his around him to be like, "Hey, man, you might not want to do that." Right, just chill out with that. Hey, let's think about another way to go and build your brand. Let's make sure your brand is something that can last. You know, during football, after football. Again, there are ways that he could do that, but he doesn't seem like the type of person that wants to listen. Uh, like when he was talking about, you know, I don't need football. Like. Bro, chill out. Like you won't have nothing. Like nothing you have right now. Without without this game, you would be like nothing. Like right. you don't have any other skills. Like what other skills do you have that would transfer into the economy that will allow you to make thirty million dollars? Right. Like you have people out here slaving for 40, 50 years and never see a, a million. A million, right? Right. Yeah. So what skill do you have other than playing football that would allow you to make this kind of money? Yeah. And then we're really kind of you know like. And again, I think it may be some situation with, you know, mentally with him, but looking at heart now, man, you got children. Like, there's no way if I got an opportunity, I don't care how much money I got, if I got an opportunity to make $30 million and I got little gents running around, right? I'm not going to blow it. I'm not going to blow that. Like, it's bigger than me. Right. It's my family. And I know you come from nothing. Like, I know you come from nothing. Right. Right. So to have them little gents there and have opportunity to secure a $30 million bag guaranteed for them children. And and mess it up because whatever reasons, like, bro, like a lot of people, but, but, just but, as a man, you're going to like, bro, come on. Like you got a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. You got 30 million birds in the hand yeah. that you just said because I don't like these people. I'll get along with anybody to make sure I secure this bag for my right. children because he don't have no other way to do that. But you see, but that's what I'm saying. I think that that's insanity. And I didn't think about it. But that um, Vontez Burfitt kid probably spiraled something that did that. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. Like, mm. football players, especially people in the NFL, you yeah. make it and you make it to a higher level mm-hmm. and you play past, I want to say, two, three, four, five years. Yeah. Like, that does something to you mentally and physically. Yes, it does. And so my mm. thing is, man, like, and, and, and I want to get to the CBA with it because – you don't have guaranteed contracts. Mm-hmm. You can sign a contract, Odell Beckham, mm-hmm. and then they can cut you mm-hmm. and they can trade you off to, you know, uh, Buffalo Bills. Nobody yeah. wants to go to the Bills. Yeah, yeah. Nobody wants to go to Ohio and play for the Browns. Yeah. You know, Warren Sapp said he didn't want to go to the Raiders. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he didn't. Yeah, he, I know he didn't. He so, just went because, yeah, you know, they was paying him. That was, that <laughs> yeah. was the death. He, Brandy Moss even said that. That's the death. That's where they send you so your career could die out, mm-hmm. right? So my point is, man, they could do anything with you, and then that's it. Like, I mean, a lot of these players, a lot of players, you know, from inner cities, you know, money management. You know what I'm saying? You're not set up for life, man. They give you $200,000 game check. You're going to you're paying off your mama's bills, yeah. mortgages, and stuff like that, man. You're in survival mode. You're in survival no mode. No matter how much money somebody gives you, if your mind's in survival mode, like, that's how you're going to manage it. But you don't hear about issues with former, present and former NBA players as opposed to NFL players. Because I think it's of the collective bargaining agreement where you don't have a guaranteed contract. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. people think Antonio signing that $30 million deal, well, that's, well, okay, was that was that the, was that guaranteed? It was guaranteed, okay, un- guaranteed. until he until he asked 
to be released. Okay. Mm, and that okay. was that was thirty million guaranteed money, and then he asked to be released. But, so they tried to void the guarantees. I don't know if they was able to do but, it or but, not. But that's a rare situation, right? Yeah. Usually, when you sign an NFL contract, uh, you, you the signing bonus is guaranteed, correct? Yeah. You you hear guys say, okay, yeah, he signed fifty million dollar uh, contract. Twenty five million guaranteed. So you know that twenty five million is is what you're going, what you what you're guaranteed to get. The other part, and they structure it like you know you might have incentives. Yeah, they they might structure it where you know in the first year you get ten million of the guarantee, five million salary. Yeah, and they'll try to structure it out, and it'll get to the point probably the third, fourth year in the deal where it's just salary. So you just got a salary of fifteen million dollars. Okay, is he playing well enough to justify that fifteen million dollars? Or should we release them? You're right. So the, it's just how they structure the deal and yeah. where the guarantees are. So it's how much guaranteed money and then how they're going to pay it out to you. Right. But once you get to a point where there's no more guarantees and then it's just salary on the books, that's where you see well, guys will like, uh, I think um, uh, Todd Gurley is set to make like $17 million salary next year. Not going to happen. Right. right. They're probably going to release him. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Somebody else was set to make like eight of running back. I think the um, the running back in um, in Atlanta said to make like nine million dollars next year in salary. Not going to happen. They're probably going to release him unless he restructures and say, you know what? OK, y'all both pay me nine. You know, I take five. Right. To stay here. But you shouldn't have to do that, though. Yeah. But again, you have you have you know what your guarantees are. Right. Right. So you plan if you got fifty million dollar contract again at this point in the NFL, you know, that's funny money. Like, you know, that other twenty five million ain't real. You know that. So you fight for as much guaranteed money as you can get because, you know, that's what you're going to get. And the rest of it is just like for fluff. Like a lot of times, like somebody signed a hundred million dollar NFL contract. Like that's for their agent to be able to tell other players. You see, I got him a hundred million. But. Is able forty five of a guarantee, which forty five million dollars is a lot of money. But you know what's guaranteed, and you know what the contract looks like, so you know that when it get to this point, you know what? How many D tackles make eighteen million dollars a year salary? I know when I get to this point, they gonna want to have a conversation with me, right. right? I know that, right? So, and then we can try to have it up front. We can try to move it around but, but or whatever. See, okay, see, that's not a lot because I tell people this all the time, man. Right? Okay. You have bench players in the NBA making more than starting players in the NFL. Absolutely. Right? So when you factor in, okay, if you make like Ezekiel Elliott, what did he get, like 14 mil or something like that yeah. this year? Mm-hmm. Okay, so he's getting 14 mil this year. Luckily, he's in the state of Texas, right? Mm-hmm. No state taxes. Uh Per home game checks, but mm-hmm. you got to pay state taxes when you go play in other mm-hmm. uh, states, right? Mm-hmm. That don't have. Uh, yep. Yeah. Right? So then he's got to give money to his agents. That's like three percent. So it's not like it's not gonna kill him. Depending on who his agent. No, nah, it's three percent. It, it can't NFL. And most people don't know this. NFL contracts agents can't ever charge you more than three oh. percent. Ever. Oh. They can charge you less than three. Okay. So if you're a marquee player, you'd be like, man, look, you can represent me if you do it for two. Yeah. Right? Like, you can leverage that. Like, oh, you can do it for one, and then if you got me, you might be able to get some more guys. Yeah. Like, if you really, if you're a type of guy that want to go in and negotiate that with an agent. But they can never, under the collective bargaining agreement, an agent can never charge you more than 3%. Okay, so what I want, what I want to get you to talk about is what can the NFL, like, if you was a part of the CBA, right? If you was, uh, what is his name, Morris? Uh, uh, DeMora Smith. DeMora Smith. Yeah. I think he need to go. Uh, uh, yeah, I could see that. I could definitely <laughs> see that. I mean, uh, the thing with the PA, man, is, I mean, I feel like DeMora is. Soft. He represents the player, but it's not soft. I think it's not soft. I think he, like, honestly, he works with the NFL. He works with Roger Goodell. Mm-hmm. I don't think he 100% represents the players. Right. Uh, so who how's he how's he getting in that position? Uh I think he was elected by uh by uh, like you know PA leaders. Like, you know, every team has like a, a PA rep, uh and the PA reps elected him. Um again How long has he been in that position? I wanna say 
Damn near a decade. Yeah, damn near a decade. It's been a decade. Right. And, um, I mean, it, he's done a he, he's done a lot of good things. And, again, I'll say he's, he's done a lot of good. Has it been perfect? No. But he's done a lot of good things. And I'll say this. Players are getting paid now more than they ever have. Uh, they are. They're, they're making more money than they ever have. But, but but that's 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 okay. The reason why I have an issue with saying that they're get, of course they're getting they're making more money, money than they ever have. But the NFL is making more money than it ever has too. Yeah. But you know what you're getting paid as opposed to what the league is making is still like a small drop in the bucket. But it's going it's 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 not because again there there's a revenue sharing. Uh, agreement, you know, based on how much revenue the leagues make, league makes. So each team has to spend a certain amount of money on the team. Like, so the players have to get a certain amount of money. Like back in the day, like if the salary cap was a hundred million, and if you own the Minnesota Vikings, a hey, salary cap a hundred million, but I'm gonna put a team on the field for thirty and pocket the other seventy. Right? You could do that. They can't do that anymore. Like you have to spend, I want to say up to ninety or ninety five percent of the cap. Like you have to spend it on somebody. That's why now you see these huge salaries for these quarterbacks, right? Right, because because they have to spend the money, uh -huh. and a lot of times they're going to spend it on the quarterbacks because those are the guys that they know are going, you know, they're depending on to be there. Uh, on the at the bottom end of the roster again, there's always so much turnover, right? Because right? there's seven rounds of the draft, right? So every year you think about it. That's potentially seven new players that are coming into a 53-man roster. That so, and that's the bottom half of your roster that's going to be changed out. Mm -hmm. Like at least four of them guys that that's got to go, mm -hmm. and that's on every team. Like you know, the top four picks are usually going to make the team in some way, and then you're going to have fifth round, sixth round picks like me right. who stuck around, which means somebody else had to go. Right. So guys are going. It's always going to be turnover. Uh, so those aren't going to be situations where where guys are going to be, like, guaranteed a lot of money because there's so much turnover. And in NBA and MLB, like, man, those guys who are there making that kind of money, like... At the they, bottom. Uh, but they've had to, like... Like, you have guys on 10-day contracts. Right. You have guys on all types of little contracts until they earn themselves that second contract. Now, right. some of the first-round picks, they get a little bit of money up front, but them second-round picks, them undrafted guys... They ain't making a lot of money, and for the first three, four, five years, if you in the G League or you traveling, if you in the G League, but if you make that roster, line, if you make if you make the roster, it, it, it's still not like you ain't making ten million dollars. You know, this okay, guy, okay, this okay. guys at the NBA that make like one point five, one point seven, guaranteed for one year, man, that's for better, one that's for better. one year. No, yeah. then, but again, in the NFL, <laughs> I'm telling you, in the NFL, if you make the opening day roster, yeah, if you make the opening day roster. Your salary is guaranteed from that point. So, one that's why you see a lot of the guys they get cut before like the league year officially begins. Like you start seeing guys getting cut in the spring because when the league year officially begins, it'll be in a contract. At March thirty first, if I'm on this roster, whatever my salary is, is guaranteed. That's why they cut guys early. Or like for a guy like me, once I made the opening day roster, then. They owed me that two hundred thousand. They couldn't get halfway into the season and then cut me and stop paying me. But they have all types of stipulations. Man. It's business, man. Man, yeah, but see, it's what I'm saying, but like, oh yeah, it's business. But it's what you negotiate is yeah. what you deserve. And that's right? on and that's on the agents, right? right. Cause, cause you're 21, 22 years old. Okay, right. You're not right, right, you're right, not right. you're not going in and negotiate, you know, with 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 the GM of a team. Like True. True, but what I'm saying is what you negotiate from a collecting and bargaining standpoint is what you deserve as players overall. Yeah. And I just feel, man, like, oh, man, going 15, like, 20 years, like, I'm like, man, when I look at contracts mm -hmm. and stuff, NBA, MLB, the most popular sport in the, in the nation, pulling in more revenue than anything, mm -hmm. the players ain't. Players ain't being treated right. Now. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you're, not, you're not seeing a fair share. Like the fact that they could put in all these stipulations, I'm like, man, the CBA could do away with that. If right now I feel if the if the NFL CBA, I mean, collect players association, mm -hmm. if they want to, they could become the, the the biggest union, the most powerful union 
Would you agree with me? Uh, because because I tell Sean this all the time. Football is an economy itself. Yeah, definitely. I, and I think I think uh, you're you're right about like the 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 players association and players being able to come together and kind of build their own thing. Uh, again, I think a lot of guys are doing that now, and they're trying to like figure it out. But one of the things I think that's that that kind of hurts football players with football culture is it's so competitive. So a lot of times when we're out of the game, like we're still competing with each other. What you mean? When we should be partnering together. What do you mean? It's Same it's way. a competitive attitude. Okay, well, you know, like it's just like when you're playing. Okay, you make a play, I want to make a play. Yeah. You know, you know, you doing this, but well, I'm doing it better. Like you rushing, but I'm rushing over. Like it's this competitive when you're thing. Out of the game. Yeah, and then when you're out of the game, it's still kind of a competitive thing. Oh man, you doing this in wise? you doing this in business, but I'm doing this in business. Uh, you know, you got this podcast, but I'm doing this podcast. Okay, like it's like I'm doing better than you, but it's like a it's somewhat like a cultural thing because everything, especially in the highest level, and especially with football, is so competitive. Because again, a hundred guys are coming to camp, fifty of them going home. Right. right, and then it's competitive for those contracts. Yeah, right, it's yeah. competitive. So, man, how much you getting paid? Or oh, if he getting paid that, then I should be getting paid this. Yeah, right, yeah. that's the that's the environment and that's the culture of pro football. So, out of football, sometimes we have trouble uniting uh, 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 around business or around one goal or one task. And again, that's something that's I think is getting better, but. People got to understand, like, you know, with the Internet and a lot of these things that are happening now, they're they're just coming about. Like and think about like like the culture that most of these guys that play the game come from, just like boxing culture. Mm -hmm. Like they come from nothing. Right. So you come from nothing. You can, That's what you've been taught. Kind of that's what's kind of shaped the way you see things. That's what you know. Mm -hmm. And then you get put into this situation where you had had this money. And you have no clue how to handle it, how to manage it. You've never done a business deal. You don't know what a business deal looks like. You don't know what a good business deal looks like, a bad business good deal. You don't know what your worth is other than what the team tells you in your contract. Right. Like you don't know what your worth is out on the open market as a as an influencer. Like mm -hmm. you just don't know because that's just not your thing. And where the NFL I think can help a little bit more is helping guys kind of understand the value of their brand. Like me, I got a Super Bowl ring. Mm -hmm. So the value for me with that is I can get a meeting with damn near anybody in the city of Houston. Like anybody that I've like wanted to meet or wanted to find myself in a room with. Like I've made I've been to thousand dollar plate dinners, five thousand dollar plate dinners. Cause I hit the person up that's managing and say, "Hey, I'm Ellis Williams, Super Bowl champion with the Tampa Bay Bucks. I would love to come out and support your organization for this event." Oh yeah, we're gonna put you at this table with this company, mm. right? Cause I got this ring. Yeah. So, but that's value that I have to go out and kind of find myself, right? I, mm -hmm. It's not, it's not like you know somebody sending me a five thousand right, dollar check every right, month right. because I got a Super Bowl ring, right. but I can go sit that at this table and mingle with these companies and these people because of my past and because I played football and because people just want to talk to me and meet me, yeah. right? So that's where I think a lot of guys don't, we don't understand how to Take leverage that. that. And right. I'm still learning, right? I don't still have it all down, right? I still, I'm still, I'm still learning how to take that, leverage that in my nonprofit. I'm still learning how to, you know, leverage that in business. Uh, and I'm, I'm still doing that, you know? And so it's, it's, um, it, there are opportunities but the NFL again is just now, and they do a lot. I mean, if you if you go and look at some of the retired players programs and what they're trying to do in education and preparing guys for life after the game, because I don't think they do a good job of that as well. Either. They do they do a lot, but again, it comes down to you you can show a horse the water, you can't make them drink, and you've got to be in a place mentally where you feel like you know what this business development opportunity at Warden Business School that they're offering for a week for NFL players to come and sit down with some of the best business teachers in the country mm -hmm. and pay for it for you mm -hmm. and tell you to bring your idea and we're going to help you go through it and map out a business plan for how you can execute. Wow. Now, if you don't sign up to go to that, that's on you. That's on you. That's and on again, you. those opportunities are there for guys. And a lot of guys take advantage and those guys do well. But 
if like Clinton Porter and a bunch of guys last mm-hmm. week got that. in trouble for insurance fraud, insurance, right, right. right? But Clinton Porter, Porter's from the hood. Like mentally, he hasn't kind of flipped that over to where okay. How can I take who I am as Clint Portis, one of the all-time great running backs at Miami, one of the all-time great running backs for the Washington Redskins? Everybody me, know me, you me, in that state. Let me, let me, How do you let me, leverage let me, that? Let me, let me, and that's on him. Let me, let me interject right there. The reason why, I, uh, and, this, and this is why I always say culture, mm-hmm. right? And um, I saw a, a podcast, I think Reggie Bush was on. Mm-hmm. I think Arian Foster was interviewing him. Now, mm-hmm. Arian Foster is a lot like what you said, Simeon very, was. Very sharp guy, though. Right. Very intelligent guy. Very right? intelligent. So, Arian Foster is, is you know, he doesn't quite fit the mold of the culture. Mm-hmm. Right? And Reggie Bush says something that I always say about football players. Like, if you've been playing football, most likely you've been playing football ever since you were small. Mm-hmm. You don't know nothing else. Nope. And the thing about football is, especially if you were uh, if you were raised on football before the uh, social media area, mm-hmm. you were taught to eat, think, live, and breathe football, mm-hmm. right? Like meaning, man, you 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 were programmed mm-hmm. right to be a machine mm-hmm. to just read and react. Be in your playbook, anything else, don't worry about all that. It don't matter. It don't matter, right? So now, when you don't have football anymore, well, what replace, what, what is that person going to replace football with? Mm. Which is the empty vessel. Yeah. And then, so Reggie Bush was saying something of the tone like, well, you got to find yourself. Yeah, you do. Right? So the thing is, man, when Clinton Portis or whoever stops playing, they don't know who they are. Right? They yeah, don't know they're what lost. they like. Yeah. They don't know, you know, and I and I tell Sean, man, I was a dumbass. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, just a grins and giggles. I told him, I said, man, you ever hear those stories about those uh, dumb jocks that didn't read, didn't write, and they got pushed all the way through high school? Mm-hmm. He said, yeah, I was one of those. Yeah. I said, man, stop playing, man. I said, I'm talking about people that couldn't read and write and just got pushed through. He said, no, that, yeah. that was me. Yeah. That was me. <laughs> I, I couldn't people, believe it. I tell people all the time, man, when I was in, in junior high and high school, I spent so much time trying to cheat for the test. Mm-hmm. Like like elaborate schemes. This is before <laughs> cell phones. Right? Yeah. I'm putting formulas and answers on the inside of, of an Ozarka water bottle <laughs> and, and taping it. Right? Yeah. So on the label, I'll take off the label of the Zarka water bottle, put the formula and answers and stuff like that on the thing, tape it right back on the water bottle. And then when the teacher is like at the front of the class, I'm twisting the water bottle, looking at the answers, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Man. Like I didn't apply myself like most football players and mo- most people that come from our environments do. So yeah. I was a dumb ass. I was a jock, man. Yeah. Because, but you know what? I could read. I could read coverages. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's complicated. Yeah. You know? And so, and that's what I tell people, like, it's the culture. Yeah. That's how they mold us to be. Yeah. And I'm like, man, I don't I don't fault people like Antonio Brown because that he was creating. Yeah. Like, you have to sort of be that monster to be that best, right? You got to yeah. be that dog every day. Yeah. Patrick Beverly could be a dog on the basketball court, uh-huh. and he's totally rationally sane off that court, you know what I'm saying? Bruce Bowden, same thing. But when you see Bruce Bowden, he in a tie. Yeah. You know, very articulate and everything. He knows who he is. Yeah. Like because basketball players are encouraged to do other things. They can do other things but, outside but, of basketball. But Bruce left again when he retired. He went right into the studio, uh-huh. right, and started commentating. So he never really left basketball. Right. But for football players, one like I had some opportunities to coach. But the right. coaching lifestyle is, like, ridiculous. Right. Like, I don't never see my children. I don't no. really get a chance to raise my family. Mm-hmm. And we live and die based on whether we oh, win sure. or lose. And if we lose, then I got to uproot my family and go, and go move to God knows where. Right. Like, that wasn't the lifestyle I was interested in. But see, that's and that's what I'm saying. That's that I think from a psychological standpoint, that's the problem with the football culture. Because you don't encourage people to find – you don't know who you are. I didn't know, like, you know, that I liked – uh, poetry or I like books. Yeah. I didn't know what type of books I liked, yeah. you know, outside of the playbook. Yeah. You know, I didn't know I mean, I, I like political um, arguments and stuff like that, but 
I didn't watch, you know, debates and stuff like yeah, that. Man. Yeah. So my point being, um, I always football culture keeps out of football. When football is gone, you don't know how to spend your money. You don't know nothing about money management. You don't know how to invest. You don't know what the mm-hmm. Wharton School of Business is. Yeah. You know, you have people telling you, oh, let me manage your money while you're playing and you have that, and then you get ripped off. Yeah. You know? I mean, that, those are stories that happen. Uh, and again, I've had situations with money where, you know, it's been people that I, that I shouldn't have been trusting. I've had great people around me that I could trust that did a great job for me. But again, I, I, I came from nothing. So mm-hmm. I had when you come from nothing, you have to depend on what other people are telling you. And even with that, again, the NFL is going to tell you, hey, if you have a, somebody who's telling you that you, they want to manage your money, we will run a background check on them, an FBI background check. Yeah. Now, you have to go and get the background check done. So when this dude come up to you and oh, your homeboy introduce you to him and he's supposed to be doing this and doing that, he got this project, you can say, okay, give me your information. I'm going to take this to my team. They're going to run a background check on you. Right. And if they tell me you cool, then we can talk. Right. But you've got to be able to say that. Which a lot of times a 22, 23, 24 year old kid is not going to say that. Now, some of them will. The, I'll say the resources are there. Mm-hmm. And um, with, again, the NFL, I think they try to do a lot, but, but the NFL can't, they can't fix the culture that these guys come out of. Right? Well, okay, but why is it okay? Because the same culture that these guys come out of is the same culture that. These NBA players come out of. If so. you notice, though, no, it's not. Because what have you noticed about the NBA? What? What is it? That a lot of the players now aren't from here, and they definitely not from the hood. Like when you when you LeBron uh, James. That's it. Like you, uh, Paul George, Gian- Giannis, uh, Andres Kapunko, right, right, right. Uh, uh, Luka Doncic. Hell, the Toronto Raptors whole team ain't from here. Right. And again, like so. But the majority you, of you don't have a do you that. don't have a lot of Allen Iversons anymore. You don't have a lot of guys that come from the street that got entourages. They cut <laughs> that off, didn't they? Didn't they? Right, right, they right, cut right. that. You don't see that no. But, but, Damian but, but, Little ain't that type of dude. Like listen, Steph Curry ain't that type of dude. James Harden. James Harden is. Uh, I don't know. If but he's a, a he's an elite. Or, he's an elite yeah. player, right? He got elite right. talent. They will deal with that. Right. For the most part. This this basketball with our borders has forced a lot of kids from the hood yeah. out. Because if you're not an elite talent, we don't have to deal with you. We'll get this African kid that went to the private school in Europe that's <laughs> six nine and we'll give him a shot before we deal with, with you and whatever you come from. Right? The NFL the NBA changed the culture. They made it a global game. So they bring in players. From okay. every so every that. team before got that. before that, but before that you had AI going broke, you had Steve uh, uh, Spreewell going broke, you had Antoine Walker going broke, you had all these stories of these guys from the hood that were going. You had that, but I think again, I think one the one thing LeBron James and I give him credit and Chris Paul, Chris Paul. and all those guys they stepped up and they took control of their union, right? Uh, but. With them, you you can never uh, overlook the fact that <coughs> it's a smaller pool of guys. It's true. So it's easier to get these guys together, and it's a different it's a different culture, right? With football, it's it's twenty five thousand retired NFL players in, in the states today. Like, and they're going to continue to bring guys in and out. But again, the NBA they change. They they took it from a gl- a game where their talent pool was uh, mostly from the states, and now they get them from everywhere, and, and they're able to pick guys who fit the character, guys who fit the brand of what they want to put out there. Now the the marquee players again, I think what LeBron James and those guys they really started to understand how their brand drives revenue, right? Because in the NBA. Their brand, like if if you go to a Sacramento Kings game and they playing the Golden State Warriors this year, ain't nobody coming, right? Ain't nobody coming. Right. You go to a Sacramento Kings game and King James is in the building, 
everybody coming. Right, right. right. So he started, he was one of the first guys that noticed that uh-huh. and was like, man, a lot more people come mm-hmm. because of you. When I'm playing. Right. So why am I like why am I under this, you know, this salary cap thing that this arbitrary cap number that you set? Mm-hmm. I didn't set that cap number. See, that's what I'm trying to say you about set, the NFL. You said that, right? That's exactly what I'm trying but, to say. But about again, the NFL. the NFL is a different model because these fans in the NFL are going to show up no matter who is there. Like, if they going to go get another quarterback, they'll go get another running back. They ain't, ain't nobody showing up checking for no yeah, receivers. But, but, see, like, but listen, listen. But The Bucks sell out now, and then nobody like none, then nobody know like none of them dudes. Okay. If Patrick Mahomes is not with the Kansas City Chiefs. They still going to sell out. They're going to sell out, but it's going to be a lot more. The ticket value is going to go way up more, right, with Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> Because now you get playoff tickets. The, yeah, the NFL is a different, again, it's a different model. Because, yeah. the play, again, though Chris Paul and his State Farm brand, like Chris Paul, when he bring his his brand, he's bringing like an entire company with him. Right. Right. Like you're you're partnering with Chris Paul when he shows right. up. Because his, his individual brand is that big. In the NFL, like, it's just not. It's just you know, not you know that what, way. Now, you know what I think it is. Now this is just my personal opinion. When I and you know Olu, I tell him this all the time. I'm not, you know, the biggest football guy at all, but I watch basketball. Now what I notice and what I think the difference is, uh, when I do turn on a football game, I see like majority of white C, white crowd, and all that. And mm-hmm. when I watch basketball, it's a little bit more mixture of both. And I think. I yep. think they're going to sell out in the NFL because a lot of white boys played football, regardless if they made or not. I just want to go watch football because I love football. Yeah. And, you know, the NBA is mostly geared to more black people going to watch it. And, you know, like he said, I think you're looking at the stars in the NBA versus NFL. They just love football regardless of, of who's playing. They care about the team. They, they don't, don't care, care about the they players. They don't care much. who's showing up. They don't care. Yeah. They, them people like, we are Kansas City Chiefs playing fans. So <laughs> if Patrick Mahomes is there or not, we, we you talk to people, man, we have had Packers tickets in our family for 30 years. But, We've okay, had but, Chiefs but, 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 tickets. But ain't nobody those, got, those, ain't those, nobody those, got we'll Houston. Round two. We'll have to come back round yeah. two. Yeah. All right, let's story franchises. <laughs> man. Hey, listen, we're gonna come back from round two. I already kept you two minutes and thirty minutes, man. I didn't mean to keep you that long, man. Yeah. Uh, but before we go, we definitely got to have you back, Ellis. This is great. Uh, before we go, tell us real quick about your Wims Foundation and what it's about and why you started and what we'll end on that note. Well, again, I I grew up um, in Indianola, Mississippi, man, and uh, a lot of times when you grew up in those environments, again, you're unplugged from educational opportunities. Mm-hmm. You know, and again, especially when I grew up where, you know, the, the resources for education are, are typically segregated. Uh, but throughout the entire country now, if you're in a rural area, a lot of times you're off the grid and you don't get certain op- educational opportunities. So I started an organization called Athletes for Computer Science. Mm-hmm. And we teach computer science fundamentals classes to elementary and middle school kids. And our goal is really to start to drive these kids into economic opportunities that are actually tangible in the careers and try to get them to uh, not only uh, just looking at, okay, I can get a job in tech, but a lot of times, again, when you grow up in that environment, you don't feel like you belong. Like Mm -hmm. you don't feel like you have the intellect to compete with an Asian kid or a white kid from the suburb. Uh, You know, you just don't have the intellectual confidence, the intellectual swag Mm. to feel like, you know, I can compete for the best jobs in America. Uh, So, you know, with computer science and the curriculum, uh, it's about introducing the kids to computer science, to software coding, to game design. But it's really about, you know, for us, just really trying to inspire the kids to believe in themselves intellectually. So just because you don't do well in this math class that you struggle with math or you struggle with English or you struggle with writing, hey, here's something that you can do that's out of the box a little bit. Mm. And, okay, you might be getting a C or a D in this class, but don't let that kind of shape the way you see yourself intellectually because all of us aren't great in school in the same way, right? There are some people who end up running Fortune 500 companies that were D.C. students in school because they just didn't fit in that environment. Uh, So we just try, and I I bring other athletes on uh, to encourage our students 
uh, to you know as, as as education ambassadors. So and we do it via video conference. So we've done classes here in Houston, Baton Rouge, Mississippi, Florida, North Carolina, uh, Indiana. So we've um, and we do it via video conference. So I try to match you know the curriculum that we use, which is an online open source curriculum. Uh, using Google video conferencing software to connect the teachers. We, re we, re we recruit college students mm -hmm. uh, that are computer science students or education students to be able to give back and be able to go into the schools and teach these classes. And we bring our athletes as ambassadors to increase engagement and awareness and get the kids excited about these educational opportunities. Because, mm -hmm. again, as athletes, we have so much influence, right? right? But sometimes we use it you know, for things that, aren't in aren't going to be as impactful like you know sometimes and, and i'm all for like you know football camps and sports camps and those mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. but we understand that 99 percent of the children that go to these camps aren't going to make one dollar sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. playing a sport right like there is so we can leverage our influence in the classroom to kind of drive these children toward some real opportunities that can kind of pan out but in that early childhood education phase, a lot of times is where kids decide if they're smart or not, mm -hmm. right? Or they decide how they see themselves in the economy and in the world. Because I used to be that kid growing up in Indianola, Mississippi, yeah. and what I saw on TV yeah. was for them people, right? Right? It was for right. the people on the other yeah. side of the track. Yeah. Right. So I didn't see myself in that light, mm -hmm. so I didn't really pursue it. And even in my football career, yeah. again, I didn't see myself. Right. right. I just did the work, and I ended up there. Gotcha. But it wasn't something like, man, I know I can do that, right? right. So our, our goal is to really just kind of uh, help children start to see uh, that they fit within the economy however they want to. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I think we can, you know, you have to do that in that early childhood education phase, man. So uh, it's Athletes for Computer Science. Uh, it's athletesforcomputerscience.org, but you can go to Facebook, we're on Twitter, Instagram, uh, and just kind of see some of the work we do, uh, see some of the classes, see some of the interactions. I've mm. taught a lot of the classes. Mm, okay. uh, so, again, I get a chance to interact with these students, man, uh, in the classroom, I get a chance to talk to them, know their names, encourage them. And again, you know, a lot of these environments, uh, like, you know, Indianola, Mississippi, where it's, you know, 60% mm. single moms, right? right, right? right. So uh, they need a positive male voice right. that can kind of talk to them about education and the opportunities that mm. exist. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, I've done it for what, wait, three years now. Okay. We've been around and we've been working and plugging away, man, growing the organization. We've got some great corporate partners. Sam Houston uh, is, is has been a huge supporter of uh, their mm -hmm. organization okay. that a lot of the tech companies uh, in the Houston area belong to and they do a lot uh, with supporting and funding like STEM education right. uh, um, opportunities. So, you know, they've been uh, super helpful, but, you know, we want to continue to grow and expand. So, uh, we're always looking to, you know, bring on people that can help support us. Right. All right. There yeah. you have it. All right, uh, Ellis, man, we thank you for the time. It's Sean and Olu. Uh, Ellis Wims, uh, Super Bowl champ, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Man, man, you got a lot of you got a lot of film to cut up, bro. We do. We got yeah. a lot of film. Yeah, you man. Got we got some work to do. You gotta take. <laughs> Yeah, hey, take hey, a day off. Hey, listen, I already got already got like three weeks of material just from boxers and coaches that I still have to chop up. Oh, so man. this this gonna go right in the mix, man. Uh, listen, we appreciate your time. This was round one. Yeah. Definitely go. I have a round two, man. And thanks for your time, man. Yeah, cool.